Content warning. Welcome. You got cat. Previously on Degrassi Deep Dives. And Joey Jeremiah was f***ing Caitlin Ryan yeah. and Tessa Campanella. He was like, my older brother's game. You're insane to hell. Dear, I love your shit. So shiny like stars. Season two is going to introduce a new protagonist who's going to disrupt the equilibrium of the show so much. History and production. Season one of Degrassi The Next Generation was a pretty big success. It found popularity not just with the core fandom, who all shared their appreciation of the show on fan forums and blogs, but also with critics and, most importantly, the young viewers who watched it on CTV and the end. If Degrassi creators were worried that the material wouldn't resonate with American teenagers, they needn't have. It quickly became a staple of the channel and stood out as one of the highlights. Teens picked it up as reruns aired all the time as the network waited for the next season. And the next season went into production pretty quickly. Season 1 was a short one, 13 seasons and one hour made for a TV movie pilot. Season 2 was picked up for 22 episodes. They also picked up some new actors as well as a few old ones. Pat Mastroianni returned and found a place in the credits, and Spike and Snake would find themselves in larger roles as well. The new characters were clearly well developed before casting. For example, in Jake Epstein's monologue for his audition, we see a very clearly outlined version of his eventual character, Craig Manning, deeply feeling existential and hiding a deep, dark sadness and attempting to cover it with humor and connections with his half-sister Angie. A subatomic blip in the temporal fabric of creation. Okay, maybe I'm being a little melodramatic. This specificity is in contrast to some of the audition monologues from season one, as characters changed sometime before or after casting. Of course, not all characters were as clear. Some new ones, like Ellie and Marco, were clearly tweaked before making it to the screen. For some reason, Hazel is also on the season two audition tapes. This, plus the fact that she doesn't appear until halfway through season one, it makes me wonder if they were casting season two while season one was in production, but I have no evidence of that. The show's motto moving into season two was, you are not alone, a theme that is highlighted by the choice of storylines they focused on this season. The stories they chose to write and their ability to make them shine was also boosted by the number of two-parters they were able to write and record. Perhaps due to its length, season one only had one two-parter, which was the pilot. Season two, on the other hand, has multiples, the two-part premiere, the two-part finale, a wedding episode, and shout the two-part sexual assault storyline that happens in the middle of the season. The ability to split a script into two episodes gives the writer some space to let the characters really experience the story instead of needing to rush it, which is key to the success of these episodes. Two-parters would go on to be a staple of the series for the entire length of the show, including the telenovela seasons, which were, of course, made up entirely of two-parters. But the dramatic two-part episodes aren't the only place we see a message of you are not alone. It is clear that the writers wanted to represent more kinds of kids on screen, so this season also saw episodes about being gay, race-based hate crimes, and the general pressures of being different. But enough about all of that, let's talk about the season. Season 2. This season aired out of production order and in kind of a janky way no matter where you saw it. In Canada on CTV, they aired a couple of episodes out of order for reasons that I cannot understand. Like for real, they just shuffled a few around and I just cannot find out why. At least the end, I kind of get. They aired the season in two blocks. I imagine to try and figure out what they were going to do with that two-parter shout, which features a character's sexual assault. It's referred to in all of the promo and media material at the time as the date rape episode, a buzzword for a kind of acquaintance rape that occurs in a romantic setting that was in popular use at the time. But I just want to say that I'm not going to be calling it that. Most sexual assault is perpetrated by people the victim knows, so I don't actually find that term all that helpful for describing this specific situation. Anyway, if you watched my Degrassi High video, you know that this isn't the first time the U.S. got a bit squeamish when portraying controversial topics that the Canadian broadcaster seemed to have little trouble with. The Inn bought a bit of time to edit the episode by airing the first first half of season two in the winter of 02 to 03 and airing the rest of the season that summer. But that still wasn't enough and they pushed Shout back further into the timeline as well as How Soon Is Now, which was a direct follow-up and sequel episode. Also, you may note as I'm saying the names of these episodes that they all sound like titles of 80s songs and that would be because they are. 
Season 2 of The Next Generation continued its worship of 80s nostalgia by starting the iconic tradition of naming all of their episodes after 80s song titles. This would continue for many years, basically until they ran out of titles, and even then they switched to 90s and more modern songs when appropriate. My point about the air order is that I'm going to try and cover the series in order where possible, zooming in on characters when it's necessary, and for Season 2, I'm going to go by production order. This is the order of episodes on the DVDs and the one used in all the reruns runs, syndication, and even on YouTube. Season 2 starts with the introduction of Craig Manning. Earlier I mentioned that Craig seems to be pretty fully formed by the time Jake Epstein auditioned for the role, and I think I know why. In my opinion, a character like Craig is very clearly missing from the first season, a moody, sensitive heartthrob for all the girls to swoon over. You could argue that Sean tried to fill that role in season one, but his stoicism and lack of interest in things like music, art, or philosophy sort of automatically disqualifies him. Craig does not have that problem. He is an artist, a photographer. We're introduced to him in the opening shots of Wind Doves Cry, where we see him photographing a young girl. Okay, wait, no, come back. That's his half-sister. There's nothing creepy going on. He's just photographing her so he can superimpose himself into a photo of her and her dad and pretend like he's a real part of their family. Okay, so that sounds a lot creepier when I'm saying it out loud. Jokes aside, Craig is portrayed as moody and sensitive from the beginning. Me. In an infinite universe. Yeah, an insignificant planet. What are we, one of, one of six billion inhabitants? Big deal. He's incredibly volatile. In just his first episode, he seems to consider kidnapping his half-sister, running away to British Columbia with Sean and like 400 bucks, and even jumping in front of a train. Now, all of these things are very clearly motivated. Craig is trying to escape his father's abuse. But they are also the sympathetic actions of the bog-standard, moody, sensitive boy for all of the girls to dream of fixing. So, honestly, with the introduction of Craig, our cast finally feels complete. So, let's talk about him. Craig. Craig is the stepson of Joey Jeremiah, arguably the biggest main character of classic Degrassi. This could be another reason that Craig felt so complete so early on. Perhaps they had written out more of Joey's storyline earlier on in production, or maybe they just felt a passion for writing a character so closely connected to one that was so beloved. His connection to Joey also makes it a really easy parallel character. In season one, I mentioned that JT is our closest Joey analog, but with the introduction of Craig, that's really no longer the case. There are a number of plot beats for the rest of the show that are direct rip-offs from some of Joey's stories, which I say with love. I genuinely think it's great every time they do it. So Craig has come back to Toronto after an unknown period of time. The background here is a little hazy. I've mostly pieced it together by watching the season way too much, but I think it goes something like this. Craig's mom, Julia, had an affair with or left Craig's dad for Joey Jeremiah while they were still living in Toronto. Joey and Julia eventually got married, a wedding which Craig attended and where he met Emma, and they were forced to dance because they were young and cute and heteronormativity is a thing. Craig's dad got custody in the divorce. I imagine this is because of his job, he's a surgeon, and not because he's dad of the year, because he ain't. At some point, Craig and his dad moved to British Columbia, and then Joey and Julia had Angie. Angie, we know, visited Craig in BC a few times, presumably with Julia, but then the visits stopped after Julia passed away. Now, Craig and Albert have moved back to Toronto, and Craig is seeing his little sister on the sly. This isn't actually for nefarious reasons on his part. It turns out that his dad is hugely insecure and jealous of Craig having any kind of outside familial relationships. Albert seems scarred by his wife leaving him for Joey, which leads to him lashing out and hurting his kid physically. Craig is then forced to hide any relationship he might have or want to have with his stepfather and half-sister in order to keep himself safe. So this was Degrassi's first attempt at a child abuse story since Degrassi Junior High, and I think it's a huge success. Rather than the seemingly random violence enacted on Not That Rick in Degrassi Junior High, the audience sees a fairly realistic portrayal of the entire cycle. The tension, the trigger, the violence, and the cooldown period, after which Craig's dad showers him with gifts and affection to attempt to make up for what he's done. 
This works as a portrayal of what real victims have to go through, but it also serves the narrative purpose of showing the audience what Craig has to live with so that we understand the stakes later on. Because we've seen exactly what triggers his dad to start beating Craig, he seems particularly sensitive to feelings of abandonment, for example. We know that when he gets done with a phone call letting him know that Craig was thinking of running away with Angie, that he's going to go off. This scene right here with him walking up the stairs with a golf club is literally one of the scariest in the entire show. Craig, open this door now. Craig! Okay, I'll be right over. From here, Craig is forced to try to either run away or throw himself in front of a train, which Sean Cameron is not having, by the way. Thanks to some context clues. Before, you asked me if my parents hit me, right? Did I? So? Sean suspects that Craig is being beaten by his dad and runs to tell Emma and Joey, but Joey isn't sure he can believe it until Angie reveals that she saw his bruises that afternoon in the park. Emma, who the writers decided needed to be an important part of this episode for reasons that surpass my understanding, figures out that Craig is probably hiding out at his mom's grave. Joey confronts him there, culminating in a really incredible scene. Okay, where, where am I gonna go, huh? Where am I gonna go back? back home so so dad could what do what what does he do to you he hits you doesn't he Honestly, these two are some of the best actors Degrassi ever had, and so it's great when they get to play off of each other. It just, it, this gets me every time. I'm probably not the only one either. When Doves Cry won a number of awards, such as the Directors Guild of Canada Award and the National Council on Family Relations Award, well-deserved accolades. For the rest of the season, Craig lives with Joey, who now has to juggle being a single dad, not just to his toddler, but now to a temperamental teenage boy as well. It's a really satisfying conclusion as well as set up for the rest of the show. Craig will have a few plot lines here and there in season two, none of them as serious as the premiere, but he will get into some shenanigans with a car, a classic callback, go on a disastrous date with Manny Santos, develop a relationship with the goth Ashley, and... Uh, well, then there is the finale, but we'll talk about that later. Ashley. When we last left our girl, she had just lost her boyfriend and most of her friend group due to a poorly planned out ecstasy trip. And shout out to those of you in the comments of the last one saying that this was the coolest thing that Ash ever did. <laughs> I love y'all. The Inn actually aired that finale, Jagged Little Pill, late, playing it along with the third episode of season two instead. Instead, as I mentioned in the last video, they aired the pilot as the finale. I'm not sure why they chose to play these two back to back, but it does make the storyline a lot clearer. While my wife and I were rewatching this season, my wife was confused that Ashley's storyline is just kind of left to hang for three episodes after the finale, the Craig two-parter, and then a random one about Emma hating her mom dating snake are for some reason given precedence, and playing these two back to back like that would solve that issue. So when Ashley gets back to school, she has a new look, or at least the beginnings of one. Summer has been rough for her. We learn later that she had to go to, oh my gosh, counseling all summer. And I've been paying for it, Jimmy. I spent the summer in counseling. She says this like it's the worst fate in the world, but Ash, you did take drugs because you're a type A perfectionist who thought it would make your friends think you were cool, so maybe counseling was a little bit warranted. So she was basically left alone and friendless for most of the summer. She tries to win her friends back by apologizing and appearing humble, and while it almost works, Ash just can't stop from... Maybe you should just keep a low profile for a bit. Tara, one day when a guy likes you, you'll understand how this works. Being Ash, she has no intention of ever going back to eighth grade dynamics, and so she tells Sean she'll go out with him, even though Jimmy thinks there might be a chance for them to get back together. This leads to the total collapse of the friend group, with even Terry deciding to take a side against Ash after she again insinuates that Terry just doesn't get how dating works because she's never had a boyfriend. Like, when is she going to stop doing that? I have mixed feelings about this one. I love it because it has this amazing moment. Just take the picture. Not until you smile. Take the picture, please. 
and for following up one of my favorites from season one. But I also kind of dislike the way that it implies that Ashley still needs a little humility. Her friends all turn on her because she decided she didn't want to get back together with an ex-boyfriend, who, let's not forget, ignored her the entire summer. Like, she cheated on him. I don't know why you guys think that Jimmy should get back together with her anyway. Either way, it's the official death knell in the coffin for the old Ashley. I'm sorry, the old Ash can't come to the phone right now. Oh, because she's dead. Oh, look what you made me do. In her following episodes, Ashley starts playing with darker clothes, makeup, and hairstyles. She also becomes close to a new character, Ellie, who is a literal fashion goddess. I will never be over this hair. Other than that, she basically remains the same. She still writes songs and poetry, it's just a little darker than before. She still cares about success in school, but not exactly through straight A's and conformity, as is evidenced in an episode in which she and Craig portray a scene from Taming of the Shrew through a more negative lens. This whole scene is gold, by the way. Before portraying the role of an abuser, Craig puts on a pair of glasses not unlike those his father used to wear. It's kind of a subtle moment, like they don't make too big of a deal out of it, but when I notice it, it just gets me every time. This season is a transitional one for Ashley. She's still figuring out who she is without all of the things that defined her before. She may be trying a little too hard to be deep and introspective. A shadow of black, empty, despairing nothingness. Her poetry is pretty cringy sometimes, and she decides to write a sad poem slash song about sexual assault for basically no reason in the kind of, isn't it just so sad kind of way that teenagers do when they try and engage with hard topics. But mostly I like this season for Ashley. There's a scene in the aforementioned Dressed in Black where she's playing a song for Jimmy, who she has recently rekindled a relationship with. For the first time, she feels like they're both being totally honest and open with each other and expresses that both verbally and through a song. I like this moment because Ash says that she never felt a connection like this with him before, and I can imagine that that is because Ash used to try and be what people wanted her to be, rather than being true to herself. Remember the lyrics from her song in season one. <laughs> And now that she is finally being her authentic self, she finally feels able to connect to other people, which is now reflected in her song. Of course, being her authentic self is kind of a huge turnoff for Jimmy, and she kind of realizes that but that's also part of the story. So for this season, Ash gets a pass from me. There's a lot more to talk about with Ashley, but I'm gonna hit that when we get to the finale and later in the video. Emma. Considering her part in the last season of the show, ushering in the next generation, Emma's role in this season is greatly diminished. She's still the primary grade eight character and kind of the glue that holds the junior class together, but her problems this season are much more mundane, which unfortunately has the negative consequence of making her tendency for melodrama stand out that much more. In the early part of the season, she's basically just dealing with her mom dating Mr. Simpson. Maybe I'm biased having watched Spike nurse a crush on him since the 80s, but this is one of the first storylines that makes Emma seem much less sympathetic to me. In this story, she acts out behaving rudely to Snake and sneaking out to go to the high school dance after curfew. Actually, that part's fine. <laughs> I like kids misbehaving when they're emotionally compromised. It's Emma's pouting and sulking that becomes insufferable to me, especially once she realizes that she's not the object of Craig's affection. Like, Emma, everything is always about you. <laughs> let Manny get a little spotlight. Again, her stubbornness and lack of awareness get her into trouble. For example, in a later episode, Emma accuses Archie of favoritism when she wins a school science fair that he helped judge. Never mind that this guy teaches media and computer classes, so I have no idea what he was doing judging a science fair in the first place. She never asks Snake about the judging guidelines, she just jumps straight to the accusations. When he reveals the scores the judges used, Emma realizes the error of her ways and... I don't know, actually. What was the point of this episode? What was Emma supposed to learn? Because, spoilers, it's not that she needs to stop jumping to conclusion and sticking her nose in things. She doesn't learn that. In her next big set of episodes, Emma is preparing for Snake and Spike's wedding. 
which might seem a little fast to you, and that's because it is. It's actually lampshaded within the show that they're moving very quickly. This is a two-parter that basically served as the part one finale when the end broke the season into two pieces. The primary drama revolves around um, Emma's nosiness. Manny invites Sean, Emma's ex, to the wedding after intuiting, correctly, might I add, that Emma would like for him to be there. Emma flips out, telling Manny that she shouldn't have stuck her nose in, also correctly, and Look, it's Emma and Manny fight number two. However, Emma learns a lesson about the benefits of butting in. I mean, open and honest communication when she discovers that her mom is pregnant and planning to have an abortion. So I have some problems with this one. Just to start, I want to say that I think this is a classic episode and I'll rewatch it every time. I don't actually have a problem with the episode itself so much as, I don't know, like some weird writing things that happen. Spike basically finds out that she's pregnant just as she's learning that Archie doesn't want to have kids until after they're more settled in their marriage. I think Snake is actually being pretty reasonable here. His response to whether he wants kids or not is, I believe, predicated on the idea that he and Spike are right now using family planning and so they are able to decide when they want to try for a kid. He's just operating under the assumption that Spike is on the pill, which she is, that's confirmed later. What he does not say is that he never wants children or even that a child would be a deal breaker right now. That is how Spike takes it though, which still doesn't really explain why she decides to go nuclear on the whole thing. She tells Caitlin and Lucy, and look, yay, Lucy! I believe this is her final appearance in the show that the combination of her being pregnant and Snake wanting to wait to have kids means that maybe this wedding just isn't meant to be. She then also says that she might terminate the pregnancy because then maybe the baby wasn't meant to be either, which I'm gonna be honest, doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Like for real, I'm not here to question anyone's choice in these matters, but it kind of feels like it should be one or the other. Like with the obstacle of Snake out of the way, what's to keep you from having the baby? Or if you're planning on not having the baby, then why would you break up with Snake? I don't understand why she's doing both. Either way, in a moment of parenting that I can only imagine was motivated more by stress and confusion than keeping healthy boundaries with her daughter, Spike reveals that she is considering an abortion to her pro-life 13-year-old. Emma is, of course, anti-abortion. Emma's sense of morals really remind me a lot of Liz from the original series sometimes, and she just cannot stop herself from tracking Snake down at his bachelor party, or sorry, uh, in Canada, that's a stag party, and spilling all of the beans. Snake then yells at Emma. Again, these adults are in high stress situations, so I'm trying to cut them some slack for their poor choices, but come on, man. And now the entire wedding is in question. Snake is more upset that Emma is the one to deliver the news and knew about this before he did than he is about the abortion itself, and rightfully so. He later argues with Spike that he deserves a spot at the discussion table, especially if Emma is going to get one. He maintains that some things, like abortions maybe, should remain private between the adults. He also hits on why Spike was so keen to drop the whole thing the day before, that maybe she's afraid of making this new commitment with him so quickly. Spike sticks to her guns and reminds Archie that you can't always decide the right time to have a kid and uses Emma as an example. In the end, I really like this scene. I think it's super nice about adults with different values working through them in order to make a relationship work. I think they both have valid points and make a good deal of sense. And they're not screaming or fighting with each other. They're talking to each other with mutual respect, which I love to see. And then in the end, I love seeing them running to the church in their casual pre-wedding get-ups, just happy to get hitched. I mean, my main criticism about all of this is that Degrassi is not about adults. Degrassi is about teenagers. Um, so as much as I like seeing healthy relationships modeled in this way, um, it is between adults. Between all of this, we get the storyline with Emma going to Sean and asking him to come to the wedding. He shows up at the reception and they kiss. And that's basically it. As far as the teen storyline goes, it's not very deep. Emma never apologizes to Manny for getting mad at her or her own hypocrisy. And while she feels guilt over the drama that she caused, there is no indication that she learned anything from the whole ordeal. Again. But I mean, it does mean that Emma and Sean are back together. So that's almost the same thing as character growth. The last Emma episode I want to mention, and I'll try to be brief here, is Fight for Your Right. 
or the GMO episode. The basic plot is simple. Emma and Ashley have discovered the calf is using genetically modified food to make their meals and have some concerns. They worry that adding genetic material in vitro to their food in this way may have unexpected long-term consequences and that forcing kids to eat this food is unethical, especially since most of the students don't know about the supposed risk. This has been an ongoing storyline throughout the season. During an earlier episode, Ash asked Manny to sign a petition banning GMOs and Manny asked what a GMO is. Is. Gem foods stands for genetically modified. Does that make them good? I love this scene because it's a great example of Manny being a little bit of an airhead. Like, Manny can't tell from the context of this situation, sign this petition to ban this thing, that maybe Ash doesn't think they're a good thing. <laughs> it's truly a ditz moment, but as a Manny fan, I can't help but love it. Anyway, Emma and Ashley go to Radich, but he tells them that there are no studies showing harmful side effects to GMOs and that using this produce will allow all students a chance at a healthy meal. So he shoots them down. After some encouragement from Sean, after Emma explains GMOs to him, The apples got fish stuff in them? Man, that's messed up. Emma decides not to take no for an answer. What follows is an all-out war between Emma and Radich, exemplifying Emma's stubbornness probably better than any other episode. Emma hands out flyers, then Radich has the calf prepare a propaganda piece about the school lunches. She inadvertently starts a food fight in the cafeteria, and Radich suspends her. Emma refuses to go home and then, when forced to, stands outside the school, just off the school grounds, with a sign claiming that she's been silenced by the administration. Radich then tells her he'll suspend her for a full week unless she apologizes on the video announcements. And she doesn't. There are a few things I really like about this episode. First, I like that it shows a number of different perspectives. I might be about to step in it here. I think there are fair criticisms to make about GMOs, particularly certain companies that squeeze farmers out by holding copyright for different foods, etc., etc. In the end, I really don't think there are two sides to debates based in science, like this one. But then again, the arguments being made in this episode are about values more than science. For example, Ellie says she's happy to take the risk of unexpected side effects since it means that underprivileged kids are able to afford meals at the school. I wouldn't expect you to be on the GM food side, Ellie. Didn't say that I was, but if it means kids can afford lunch. Or that people in the third world have access to famine and pest resistant food. And those kinds of arguments are the kind that Degrassi is great at. I do think the choice of GMOs was a misstep. It's kind of hard to watch now, knowing about the anti-GMO to anti-vaccine pipeline, and I'm just sitting here wondering the whole time whether 2020 Emma would refuse to wear a mask out of principle in order to defend her right to free speech. It just feels true. Even back then, I remember thinking this was a weird hill for a 13-year-old to die on. She claims later in the episode that it's about a student's right to protest, but because of the escalation of the back and forth between her and the principal, it must she just reads a stubbornness over what is a pretty petty disagreement. As much as I find these episodes more eye-rolling than interesting, though, I can't say that I dislike what they're doing with Emma's character. She feels like she never learns, but at least she's consistent. And that might not be the case for much longer. Paige. So in the middle of all these Craig and Ashley and Emma episodes, we have the Paige Michael Chuck storyline. Content warning for this part of the video. As I mentioned earlier, this part of the show revolves heavily around Paige's trauma and reaction after being raped at a party. Please go to this timestamp if you'd like to avoid discussions of this topic and look in the description if you are in crisis and need help. At the beginning of the season, Paige is on top of the world. Having knocked Ashley off her throne from season one, she cements her place as the most popular and coolest girl in school. Her spirit squad, the cheerleading team that she founded the year before, is now an established part of Degrassi Athletics and is cheering at a soccer game where she meets and flirts with Dean, a senior, uh, sorry, grade 12, soccer player from a rival school. Hey, editing cat here. So for some reason, my script says Dean, but I kept saying Dylan when I meant Dean here. I've done my best to fix it, but it's gonna sound a little weird. Sorry about that. At Paige's prompting, he invites her and Hazel to a party. Feeling pleased with herself, Paige cancels plans to see Spinner that night and shows up to the party instead. 
Being naive grade nines, Hazel and Paige way overdress, and Paige goes overboard, complimenting and laughing at Dean's jokes. A girl who appears to be jealous warns Paige that maybe she should be careful with Dean, who is three years her senior, but Paige brushes her off. Instead, she goes upstairs to an empty room with him in what seems to be equal parts an attempt to impress him and a genuine interest in spending time alone together. Once in the room, Paige is obviously hesitant. She initially tells him no to laying down on the bed together, but then changes it to a yes with a warning that she would like to take it slow. Dean shows no sign of having heard this though, and in spite of her protests, continues to press her boundaries until he pulls out a condom. Paige, obviously terrified and feeling trapped, begs him to stop and to get off of her, but the camera pans away instead to the party outside. It's honestly a very real and raw depiction of revoking consent, though technically she never really consented to sex in the first place, and how something like that can look from the outside. What I mean is, to everyone at the party, both before and after, Paige was a willing participant, actively chasing him and even going up to the room with him. The show is not afraid to show her as initiating contact. She kisses him first when they are alone in the room, or to show her changing her mind, from a yes to a no when she feels that he is moving too fast. These nuances are important for two reasons. One, because this is what sexual assault looks like a lot of the time. Someone continuing to cross a boundary once consent is revoked, or coercing consent in a situation that might not be equal, like Paige initially hesitating, telling him no, and then changing her mind. And second, it's important to help the audience sympathize with Paige's feelings of guilt. As I'm sure you know, many survivors of sexual assault feel guilty for their supposed role in the situation. Some even refuse to come forward and get help because of it. Now, I think that this is often misunderstood because why exactly they feel that way is not always clear to people who have never experienced it before. It's easy enough to have heard that victims feel guilty, but understanding it is something different. With this storyline, we can empathize with why Paige would feel responsible, not because she is, but because we understand, having watched the episode, that she felt so in control of everything until that final moment. She got him to invite her to the party. She got him to take her up to the room. And if she felt as if she had all of the control, then how could she truly be a victim? But the show does one more thing right. It never once questions if what happened to Paige was rape or not. From the moment that she tells Hazel that she said no, it is characterized for what it was. That moment, by the way, when Paige fully processes what happened to her, gut-wrenching. Up until that point, Paige has been behaving as if it were a fully consensual act. Even after she tells Hazel the truth, she's resistant to getting help. Even now, with her friend telling her what happened to her was wrong and illegal, it's hard for her to believe it. You didn't do anything. So I didn't dress like a slut? I didn't drink? I didn't come on to him in front of the whole party? Paige, I guess I didn't ask him to go upstairs either. You said no. It doesn't matter. In the following episode, Paige, Terry, and Hazel are reforming PMS for a battle of the bands. Unhappy with the direction of the music, Paige asks Ash to rejoin, thinking that this might bring some gravity to their sound. It does, uh, maybe a little too much. Ash writes a dark piece about sexual assault. The lyrics trigger Paige, who storms out of the rehearsal. Ash follows her into the hallway where Paige breaks down and comes clean about what happened to her. Ashley then agrees to play the original, non-explicit lyrics. This is a really sweet moment because Ashley is basically putting down Paige up until the very moment that she realizes what happened to her, after which she absolutely respects Paige and everything that she's asking for. Then, in one of my favorite, if admittedly super corny moments of the show, Dean appears in the crowd at the performance. In a moment that could only happen in teen drama, Paige takes lead vocals, deciding to sing the new, more explicit lyrics in a show of strength and re-empowerment. In the end, PMS don't win the Battle of the Bands, a combination of Paige's voice and choosing to sing a song about sexual assault, they joke. But Paige does find it in her to finally seek counseling. 
For most of the rest of the season, she sees a guidance counselor once a week off screen. Towards the end of the season, in How Soon Is Now, we see the progress she's made. She seems to have let go of her guilt, at least intellectually, and is confident that she doesn't need the weekly sessions anymore. However, she seems to question all of that when she finds out that Dean is going to be coming to her school for a basketball game. How Soon Is Now is about Paige's continuing feeling of helplessness. In this case, she feels helpless to hold the guy who did this to her accountable. She is informed that very few cases like hers end in conviction, a reality that many victims have to deal with and chooses not to put herself through a trial that could very well end in acquittal. In the subsequent days, she's anxious and depressed, and then she sees Dean trying that same flirtation with Manny, who is a year younger than she is. When, in her frustration, she confesses what happened to JT, who she's been forming a sort of friendship with all season, she expresses a fear that no one will ever be able to hold him accountable. JT, in a boss move, immediately runs into the auditorium to interrupt the game to try to fight Dean and call him Mr. Rapist in front of the entire school. When all four foot eleven of JT is unable to dish out the justice that Paige deserves, Spinner, finally realizing what has been going on this whole time, goes after Dean himself. Finally, at the end though, Paige steps in. There's no need for physical violence, she says, because she's going to be pressing charges and he's going to jail. The episode feels very complete with Paige again finding a way to take back her power in this situation. On the whole, the storyline is really one of the best in early Degrassi TNG. It's well thought out and fully realized. It is given weight and time to breathe, and I really feel like the writers put a lot of time into making sure they did this storyline right. It's not the first time that Degrassi tackled this subject. These themes were present in Degrassi Junior High and High School. This is the first time that the show has dealt with this level of assault by a peer, however, and it's the only one so far to deal with the fallout and ramifications of this kind of abuse long term. We will be following Paige on her journey for justice in the coming seasons and seeing how these events have affected her for a while longer. Finale so the final part of season two that I really want to dive into is the finale. The finale is another Craig episode, wrapping up his storyline that was started in the premiere. This is, I believe, the end of Degrassi's bookends for the most part. From now on, premieres and finales may focus on one theme or character, but storylines will play out mostly continually over the normal course of episodes. I believe that this reflects not just a change in television at the time, which was starting to turn its eye to more serial storylines, a la The Sopranos, which had premiered just a few years earlier, but also in storylines that the writers wanted to tackle. With Paige's storyline, they discovered that they could deal with harder topics with more depth and sensitivity over the course of more episodes, and they brought that experience forward into newer seasons. In other words, the Degrassi writers discovered the magic of multi-episode character arcs. Often, from now on, stories would no longer be resolved in one episode or left totally unresolved as in Degrassi Classic, and instead we would see how they played out over a longer time frame, sometimes seeing the lingering consequences over episodes or even seasons. But I digress. This is about Craig. So when you're first watching this one, it seems like it's just another regular Craig episode, which we've had a few of at this point. He's struggling to study for science class. He's nervous to ask Ashley to the dance, you know, typical teen boy stuff, until Albert rolls up. Craig's dad is back. It's a surprising moment, I think, because for the most part, the show has played what happened between Albert and Craig very close to the chest. You almost think maybe the show's forgotten about it. Aside from the aforementioned moment with the taming of the shrew scene, the show doesn't really spend much time on it. Either way, it certainly makes this moment kind of a gut punch to viewers who aren't expecting it. His dad tells him, of course, that he's been to anger management and has gotten better. It's heavily implied, and maybe even confirmed elsewhere in the episode, that Albert shouldn't really be here right now, that there are proper channels to go through, and that uh, Canadian CPS would not be very happy about this. Let me... hold up. Okay, Canadian CPS is called Child Welfare. Got it. Craig keeps the secret, in part, I think, because that is how Craig learned to earn his dad's love. We saw in the first episode of the season that he felt like he had to hide his need for connection with his sister from his dad because his dad just could not deal with it. This has led to Craig being something of a people pleaser and a liar by omission, as he's had to try and figure out in his life how to avoid conflict and soothe those around him. Albert has actually set up Craig perfectly to be victimized, both by himself and by anyone else who might take advantage of the survival instinct that Craig has been forced to cultivate. 
Actually, Albert's smooth manipulation here is really good. In an act of apparent selflessness, he offers to give Craig a place to study and helps him out. This looks like generosity, but it's actually just another way for him to control Craig, to convince him to come over even after Craig initially told him that he wasn't going to. Then, on a later day at dinner, he uses those same manipulation tactics, control tactics disguised as generosity. For example, he shows Craig a ticket to Europe for a trip that he tells them they are going to be taking that summer, which he booked without asking and without Joey's permission, of course. Also, just a note, this is Europe. Um, this isn't the last time Craig will have bad luck revolving around Europe. Europe is kind of a red flag area for Craig, so just keep that in mind for later. Albert eventually completely shows his hand and reveals that he's using all of these tactics to get Craig comfortable with the idea of moving back in with him by the fall. When Craig is resistant to the idea, his dad becomes defensive and jealous. When things get heated in the restaurant, he decides to leave it, perhaps a sign of growth. I've always wondered if this is a technique that he learned in anger management, take himself out of the situation situation that is making him want to get violent. Whether it was or not, it doesn't work. Craig chases him down the street and Albert explodes. He tells Craig that he's going to waste his life just like his mom did with a used car salesman and in one of the sickest burns I've ever heard on the show. Some interesting little goth girl. Don't talk about that. Like Craig lashes out and pushes his dad, which causes Albert to brutally backhand Craig, leading to... Will never happen again? Because huh? that's what you always say! Because you always screw up. And you're the one who screws up! It won't change! Ever! While I was doing research for this video, I rewatched this episode live on TikTok, and the entire time, all I could talk about was how much I loved this scene. This is peak teen soap opera right here, and I'm just living for it. Jake Epstein gives a great performance here, as usual. I just like, I really love his intensity that he's bringing to it, but it also gets even better as we move from this part to part two. But first we have to end the episode. Craig gets home and can't hide his injury from Joey, so he comes clean about seeing his dad. He tells Joey that he knows that he shouldn't have hidden it, but now he's done. He wants to go to child welfare and make sure that he never has to see his dad again. He wants Joey to be his full legal guardian. It's a really nice moment and it would be a great place to end the season, except of course there's more. The next morning, two officers show up at Joey's door and deliver news that Albert passed away in a car accident the night before. Foreshadowing. So, part two isn't about Craig and Ash or the aftermath of Craig's choice to make Joey his legal guardian. Instead, it's about Craig's response to his dad's death, which honestly seems to inform a lot of Craig's character moving forward. So, just to break away for a moment, I'm going to do something here that I haven't yet. Over the course of the series, I've tried to avoid looking too far into the future. Aside from occasionally mentioning that some storylines might pop up again or making vague references to well-known events, I've tried to keep the spoilers to a minimum, especially spoilers for like future stories of characters that we are talking about right now. But I'm going to break that rule to talk about Craig for a bit. If for whatever reason you're watching this, having only seen up to about, I don't know, season three or so of this series, be warned, spoilers incoming. So, in season four, Craig is diagnosed with bipolar disorder. We're gonna talk more about his diagnosis and the portrayal of his symptoms as we get closer to that story, but I'm just going to say for now that I find his manic and depressive episodes fairly well-grounded, especially when compared to a certain other character who gets diagnosed, misdiagnosed maybe, <laughs> later on. And it would be very easy for me, as someone who is making a retrospective right now, to look at this episode and see Craig's reaction to his father's death and say, well, okay, look at this. He goes through a manic episode here. They were laying the groundwork for this. And honestly, I don't think that that's a terrible reading of the material. And if you want to do that, then I say go ahead. But if you're expecting me to do that here, I'm not going to, because I think that ultimately the message of this episode is not that Craig is reacting strangely because he has bipolar, but because grief is just weird. And it's especially weird if the person you're grieving is someone who has hurt you or someone you were in an abusive relationship with. Later on in the episode, Terry is going to talk to Craig about her mother's death, and when she tells Craig that she was angry when she found out that her mom died for what were honestly very petty and childish reasons, because she was a literal child, Craig is confused. But why would I be reacting this way? I hated my dad, he says. I wanted him gone. <sighs> 
So why am I crying now that he is? And Terry says, Cause you love him. And I think, for me anyway, it does a disservice to chalk all of that behavior up to this character will later be diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I think the show is trying to portray the complicated process of grieving someone who abused you and hurt you or left you. And I really appreciate it showing the complicated process of grief. And so I just wanna say that early on here. And also just that there's no wrong way to interpret this, by the way. I know a lot of folks really dislike Craig, some for good reasons, I think, especially later on. But also some people really like Craig. And no matter how you feel, I think that's totally valid. So if you find comfort in Craig's reaction being part of a mental illness, especially if it's one that you might share, that's totally good too and keep doing you. Anyway, as I've implied, what happens is that Craig reacts strangely. After Mr. Simpson inexplicably tells the whole class that Craig won't be joining them because his dad died, also big what the fuck moment here from me, why would you do that Mr. Simpson? Craig shows up to school anyway. He lies to his friends, telling them initially that he was in the car with his dad, which baffles them when he laughs it off and says that he was actually just kidding. I feel kind of like this is part of a fantasy maybe on Craig's end. He tells his friends that he couldn't stop his dad from speeding even though he told him to slow down. And I wonder if Craig is like imagining this scene because maybe it's easier to deal with the idea that he couldn't have stopped it even if he was in the car at Albert's funeral, Craig also has an off response when one of his father's co-workers says that Craig was the most important thing in Albert's life. Craig finds that kind of funny, maybe a little ironic, and has to leave, but I think it's actually really honest. In fact, maybe even too honest. There's a moment where he says, Please. Albert told me time and time again how his son Craig was the greatest gift he'd ever received a gift he cherished, a gift he never wanted to relinquish. <laughs> <laughs> and it is very telling. Even in this eulogy, it's clear that Albert only loved Craig as a possession, a thing to own or relinquish. And this is the mindset that caused so many of his problems with his son. In another out of character moment for Craig, he enters himself and Ash into the Luau King and Queen contest, which is uh, the first in a long line of culturally iffy Degrassi dances, by the way, where they go up against Spinner, Paige, Jimmy, and Hazel. This is the B plot for the episode. It's mostly Paige and Spinner playing comic relief to the serious A plot by getting sunburned and sporting fake tans and just generally having a bad time. These moments are really good, plus a couple of the other fun side bits, like this one here, where Craig says that he's borrowing one of Joey's shirts for the luau. I hope you don't mind, but I borrowed one of your old shirts. <laughs> Presumably because Joey Jeremiah just has Hawaiian shirts to spare. They add levity to what is otherwise kind of a hard episode. In the end, Craig and Ash win Luau King and Queen, possibly due to getting the pity vote, because I don't really see either of them as being too super popular with the student body. When this happens, Craig has a moment where he thinks he sees his dad in the audience. This is really common, actually. Bereavement hallucinations, which can vary from sensory hallucination to just a simple feeling of sensing that a loved one is around who has passed away, are reported by anywhere from 39 to 80% of people grieving a serious loss. When Craig realizes that his dad isn't really there at the dance, he breaks down and lashes out physically. After Craig runs off, Mr. Radich tells Ash not to chase him and give him some time. Who we do see follow Craig, though, is Terry. I love this moment because Terry hasn't had a lot of moments in season two. In fact, she doesn't get a lot of moments in Degrassi in general. We will begin rolling on to her big storyline next season, but for the most part, she's mostly just left on the sidelines. I'm not sure they always knew what to do with her. But for this episode, someone in the writer's room remembered that Terry has been through this before. We have long established that she has been through the loss of her mother, making her the perfect character to reach out and connect to Craig. There's a moment earlier in the episode where she has to remind someone that she actually knows what he's going through better than anyone else there. When she hears her friends passing judgment about his odd behavior, she feels the need to defend him, and maybe that's what leads her to follow him here and be there for him. I also like this moment where Radich sees her there and decides to leave them be. Radich often makes poor decisions about the students and what he needs to do. We'll get into that later. But I like him realizing he's not needed here and just giving them space. That's nice. In the end of the scene, Craig sort of is forced to accept that maybe he is grieving his dad, even if it doesn't look like what other people's grief looks like, and he goes back to Ash and apologizes. 
And that's the finale. I really like it, if that wasn't clear. It's just the right amount of melodrama and character building. Unlike season one, it doesn't have a downer cliffhanger. Instead, I think the audience feels like Craig is much better equipped to deal with what lies ahead of him now. Overall, season two is much stronger than season one. It has the benefit of being longer, having more two-parters, and having a strong first season under its belt, giving it a chance to try new things. Those new things, darker and realer storylines for the most part, would embolden the writers to go even harder in the next season. On the Degrassi.tv website, after season two aired, they teased fans that the next season would be the most real realistic and intense yet. This would prove to be true as the next season would tackle coming out, self-harm, abusive relationships, and would be, I believe, the very first season to use the slogan, it goes there. But before that, let's take a break, refill our popcorn, get our drinks, and talk about a few things I missed out in. Everybody wants something, they'll never give up. Everybody wants something. Hey, That's a dumb song. Intermission. This is the part where I just talk about stuff that doesn't fit anywhere and stuff I just want to mention. The shameless Joey and Caitlin shipping happening in the wedding episode is great and a sign of things to come pretty soon. Jimmy and Spinner. This season sees the friendship between these two boys splinter and eventually break. Every episode that features the two of them has at least one moment that tests their friendship. First, in the breakdancing episode that introduces Marco, in which they sabotage each other's attempts to win the competition due to what is honestly just a dumb misunderstanding. It does feature this great moment, though. Yeah, I get it. I can't dance because I'm white. That's not what I'm saying. In the next episode, Jimmy is upset that Spinner managed to get Ellie's number and so humiliates him when he has a boner in front of the whole class. I really like this storyline, by the way. I actually have a soft spot for any stories that can be summed up as puberty shenanigans. It, for some reason, reminds me of that episode in like Degrassi Junior High where Yik calls into a radio show because Arthur is worried that he's having too many nightly emissions. <laughs> It's just so adolescent boy and I love it. There's also a plot where Jimmy and Spinner decide to be brutally honest with each other after learning that honesty can have upsides, but of course, unfiltered honesty can also often backfire. You're a bum and you hang out at my house too much. That's because you pee on the toilet seat. My mom doesn't want you over. And so by the end of the episode, they decide to go back to normal. Finally, Spinner gets irritated when he feels like Jimmy doesn't appreciate his wealth and all the opportunities and things that it affords him. Spinner's ADHD doesn't come up explicitly ever again, as far as I can remember, but Spinner does a lot of impulsive things, which can be a symptom of ADHD, and he does one in this episode. He steals Jimmy's MP3 player and attempts to sell it, but gets busted by Jimmy before the deal can go down. This is ultimately what cracks their friendship. You're my best friend. Was. This relationship will see its ups and downs over the course of the show, but I really liked watching it this season since the strain on it is clear the whole time. You can kind of see what's happening. Because of this, the conclusion of their friendship really being tested at the end of the season makes a lot of sense. Marco. It's our boy, Marco Del Studley. He shows up in a couple of episodes this season as a sort of, I guess, teaser for his big arc next season, which is as, of course, Degrassi's first gay main character. Marco enters the show as Ellie's love interest. She has a crush on him, but because of his reputation with the ladies and his popularity, she thinks he'll never be into her. Instead, he proves that he's a sweet and sensitive soul who really gets Ellie, and eventually they do start going out. However, things take a turn pretty quickly when Ellie becomes confused about why he never seems to want to kiss her or do anything romantic. She's convinced it's something to do with her until Ash suggests that maybe he just doesn't like any girls. Ellie eventually decides to put that to the test by taking him up to Ash's room during study group. You're beautiful. That's not what I mean. Do you think I'm hot? So I have mixed feelings about the way this story was handled in this season. I like the gradual coming out of Marco Del Rossi from his early confusion to his eventual confession to Ellie. It's very reflective of the queer youth experience in the early 2000s from my own experience and from what I saw with my friends. But this episode is mostly told through Ellie's perspective and that's clear in the framing of some of the scenes. Marco is clearly confused and scared, but because he is not sharing that with anyone, we never really hear it verbalized. Then we have Ellie expressing her frustration to both Ash and Marco. A frustration that is totally valid since she's just as lost and confused as him in this situation. It's her first relationship and she feels like she's doing something wrong. But we never really get to understand what Marco feels like he's going through until those final moments when he finally tells her tearfully that he wishes he liked girls, but 
he just doesn't and he's confused about it. Still, the moments where he does things like Google if he's gay is very real and luckily we'll get more of Marco's own experience next season. Manny. Manny's role in the show is growing, but we're not quite at the point where she needs her own section. However, I do need to talk about one episode that stands out to me as unskippable. Take my breath away, or the episode where Manny has a date with Craig. So Manny has been nursing a crush on Craig all season. There's a cute moment early on in the season where it looks like Craig is going to ask Emma to dance, but he ends up turning to Manny instead, which is a fun audience subversion and accidentally sets up what has to be one of the more iconic Degrassi couples. In Take My Breath Away, we finally get the culmination of all of that crushing in what is, in my opinion, a masterclass on how to do unreliable narrators in a teen drama in a humorous way. Rashomon, but make it a Canadian teen soap opera? Unfortunately, this is something Degrassi isn't going to do very often. The style for this show is typically an uncomplicated, straightforward telling of events, which works well for the most part. I would argue that this grounded style is actually the show's signature early on, but the success of this episode does make me wish that they'd played around with the style a little bit more from time to time. So in this episode, as I mentioned, Degrassi breaks with tradition. The viewers see two sides to the date as Craig and Manny each share the stories with their friends in a scene reminiscent of something like Grease. I cannot overstate how fun this is every time I watch it. It's always such a treat. Early on, we're given hints that Manny might not be super reliable when it comes to this kind of thing when we see her fantasy of Craig asking her out, which seems more rooted in romantic movies than in reality. This continues as she shares her perspective of the date, in which Craig was the perfect gentleman and she the perfect blushing ingenue. She brushes her fingers against his lips as she feeds him cotton candy. She gracefully thanks him for winning her a toy at the softball throwing booth. When Craig's version rolls around, though, we see a different side of Manny. Gone is the mature young lady, replaced instead with a childish, overly excitable girl who shoves cotton candy into Craig's face, uses phrases like yummy yum yum, and squeals over her stuffy stuff collection. As viewers, I think we're meant to infer that the truth is somewhere in the middle. Manny is a year younger, and her inexperience with dating might have led to awkwardness on the date, but Craig is also biased here, admitting that she reminds him of his younger sister. Which, by the way, is a cute nod to the fact that the girl who plays Angela is related to the girl who plays Manny. Unfortunately, despite trying to get over that fact, Manny just ends up pushing way too hard, her inexperience with relationships leading her to move forward way too fast, despite her friend's objections, and and in the end, Craig ends up dumping her for, in her words, being too young, something that will make a lasting impact on Manny moving forward into season three. Hazel. They were still finding a spot for Hazel in this season, and for the rest of Degrassi, honestly. She was criminally underutilized the entire show. But her one episode in this season has always stood out to me. Don't Believe the Hype is an episode about stereotypes. The B plot is about gender stereotypes, which is fun, but the A plot is about racial stereotypes, or in this case, something even more complicated, Islamophobia. And if you're gonna get in my comments and tell me that Islam isn't a race and therefore criticism of bigotry towards Muslims isn't the same as racism, I'm A, I'm not gonna listen to you, and B, I'm gonna recommend that you go watch Philosophy Tube's excellent essay on the topic, which I'm going to link in the description. Hazel Adin is Muslim, but not visibly so, unlike Fariza, another girl at their school who chooses to wear hijab. In her attempt to keep other girls from learning her secret, Hazel bullies Fariza, specifically calling out her hijab as being a fashion violation, which offends even Paige, so you know that the show is framing it as especially bad. During a multicultural event at their school, Hazel pretends that her family is from Jamaica rather than from Somalia in an attempt to cover her tracks even more. But when Fariza's display is vandalized with the word terrorist, Hazel is seen as the prime suspect. She didn't do it. It's revealed to be some unnamed grade 10 boys, but she feels guilty for contributing to the bullying and hiding her truth. She comes clean to Fariza, admitting that she was bullied at her old school, beaten up by a group of girls, and then redoes her Heritage Day report for the class the next day, coming clean. She explains that Fariza's choice to wear hijab on a daily basis is a personal and brave choice, and that she wears hers when she goes to mosque. Obviously, as someone with very little personal experience with Islam or 
or Islamophobia, I cannot grade this on sensitivity or accuracy, but I can tell you that this story stood out to me as a teen because of its timeliness. It came out not long after the U.S. invaded Iraq, which is Fariza's home country, and as a teenager because I learned something from it. I specifically remember learning the word hijab from this episode and after watching it, doing some research into why some Muslim women choose to wear it and some don't. I don't know that it carries the same strength now. Multiple Degrassi characters have gone on to wear hijab since then, for example, and I feel like media has talked about it much more than when I was younger, but it always stands out to me when I rewatch this season because of what it meant to me then. The complicated relationship between Hazel and Fariza is also, I think, handled well, with Fariza saying that Hazel's experience being physically assaulted for being Muslim is not an excuse for her to bully others. And by having the real perpetrators be some unrelated boys off screen, I think it just skirts the trope of the self-hating minority that pops up in media from time to time, which can sometimes be utilized to imply that most bigots are just secretly part of that minority themselves, which is problematic. Most minorities are not oppressing themselves. Oh, and this episode also has this amazing deleted scene where Hazel tells Paige that she wouldn't understand what she's going through. You won't understand. Why? Because you're white. <laughs> I literally screamed the first time I saw this. Toby. In this season, Toby develops disordered eating habits in order to make weight on the wrestling team. It's Degrassi's first brush with eating disorders since Kathleen and Degrassi Junior High, and the fact that they chose Toby is worth mentioning. The episode makes it clear that disordered eating is not locked to any specific gender, and that seems to be appreciated, at least if the comments under the episode on YouTube are anything to go by. Editing cat here popping in to say that I can't believe I forgot to talk about Kendra Mason. So early on in season two, Toby meets and starts dating Kendra, a Chinese Canadian girl who it turns out is actually Spinner's adopted sister. Toby and Kendra bond over their shared love of anime and computers and kind of all things geeky. I love Kendra, but I tend to forget about her, honestly, because I think she was kind of mistreated by the Degrassi writers. They tended to forget about her and treated her mostly as a supporting character for Toby's storylines. So as interesting as she could have been and as cool as she could have been, she mostly gets relegated to the sidelines. And so I don't really have that much to say about her, unfortunately. I love you, Kendra, and I wish we'd gotten more of you and your relationship with Spinner. Like in an alternate reality, that would be so cool. Oh, well. JT. JT becomes obsessed with dating Paige and like I mentioned earlier, starts up a friendship with her. There's a cute episode where Paige is paid to go on a date with him as a mean sort of prank, but it actually works out for him as he gets a kiss and Paige learned that she finds the little twerp pretty funny and sweet. Their friendship actually continues for a while, a bit of continuity that I always appreciate. Terry. Terry gets a modeling gig this season in the same episode as Toby's food stuff. This is kind of a low-key sequel to the episode last season where Toby's agent mom gave her a business card. Terry is embarrassed to be seen as a plus-size model, even though she's a freaking model, so she's totally stunning. And eventually, Spinner is the one who tells her so. Terry, you're pretty. You don't have to lie. I'm not lying. Terry, you're really pretty. And any guy who tells you different is blind or jealous. So just tell him to shut up. Ugh, Spinner. I hate that this never happened for the two of you. They are so cute. Sean gets drunk at Jimmy's party. So early on in the season, Jimmy and Sean kind of try and bury the hatchet of their beef from last year when they're both on the basketball team again, and Jimmy invites Sean to a party. Unfortunately, before the party, Sean decides to get totally trashed at Emma's parents' house due to some insecurities that he's having and kind of messes up the party for everyone involved. Jimmy ends up kicking him out, and this kind of kills their chances of becoming actual friends, at least within season two. I only mention it because Sean getting drunk at Jimmy's party is one of those things that sticks out to me as being just a really memorable scene. It has it has really believable drama and stakes and some kind of funny lines as well. Oh, yeah. oh what's going on? Hey. There's a party here. Yeah, I thought you were coming, man. No, I am. This is a party. I love parties. Yeah. Craig steals Joey's car. This is just an amazing callback to Joey getting his friends to steal Snake's parents' car. I love the parallels between Joey and Craig, and they really only get stronger in the coming seasons as Craig lives with him, forms a band. We can't be like the Zit Remedy. We can't be lame. And of course, fucks Tessa Campanelli. <laughs> Sorry, I mean Manny Santos.
the Degrassi Billboard, we're only going to be ranking three songs instead of a couple more songs that pop up next season for reasons that I'll talk about when we get there. So there are only three songs in season two, unless you count the helium version of Everybody Wants Something. So coming in at number three is Manny's Fantasy, where she imagines Craig asking her out in the form of a song. Won't you be my sin? I love everything about this. We get to hear Manny sing, which we don't get to hear very often in the show. I actually think she has a nice voice. And uh, Craig rhymes Cinderella with Manuela, which I don't know why, but it gets me every time. That's so good. Coming in at number two is Terry's song for PMS, particularly when it's sung by Hazel. I wish I knew just what to do yet to make This is actually, I think, objectively a worse song than the Manny fantasy song, but it makes me laugh harder, so it ranks higher. And ranking in at number one is, of course, Poor Thing, or Paige's Revenge Anthem. It happens to other people. You say, how sad. You say, poor thing. But when it's you, it's something else. It's everything. I loved this song so much that I got a really poorly ripped MP3 of it and had it playing on a website that I had around this time. I honestly think the lyrics are a little too melodramatic, although the fact that they are supposed to have been written by teenagers kind of softens this a little bit for me. But I really do like the beginning. For some reason, it happens to other people. You say how sad you say, poor thing, but when it's you, it's something else. I, for some reason, that always gets me. I really like that a lot. So it's number one. Degrassi Fashion Corner is going to be particularly hard because the wardrobe is making some big moves in seasons two and three. Shoutouts include Ashley Kerwin, who has a number of looks ranging from proto-goth to full-on hot topic goth girl. I absolutely love her style this season, even the stuff that objectively doesn't work is really fun for me. Ellie shows up this season with some really iconic hair. Most of her looks throughout season two and three are things that I probably would have worn around this time. Emma has painted jeans again in season two, of course. Chris has a major hat and headphone game in this show. They really wanted to portray that this guy was a DJ the minute he got on screen. Like, before any characters said any line of dialogue about him, they wanted you to know, this guy's a DJ. Sean Cameron in season three just looks like he's cosplaying as Eminem the entire time. And even the characters say so, so I don't feel particularly clever having noticed it. All Eminem on the outside. Unlike my man some shady over there, I actually read it but I can't not say anything. And the number one look in the Degrassi fashion corner is JT York's hey, don't, don't be all up my in my fries dog. dog look, which is amazing because I think what's happening here is Degrassi is making fun of the way that commercials will dress young actors in an attempt to make them like quote unquote urban or cool. But to be honest, I'm not sure that Degrassi should be calling out anyone else's wardrobe department. It's a little bit glass houses. And that's it. I, we will talk about Manny, don't worry. <laughs> We're getting to Manny. In fact, we're gonna talk about it right now. We made it, season three. Possibly, at least to me, peak Degrassi. Or at least peak early season Degrassi, anyway. There's a lot of different great eras of Degrassi, but as far as the early seasons go, this is the peak to me. What I mean when I say this is one of a few things. One, the marketing for this season, both on Degrassi.tv and on The Inn, which is how I watched it at the time, focused heavily on the fact that this season was going to be intense. Intense fights, shocks, and revelations. Bold moves. Bad moves. This was, as I mentioned before, the first season that used the It Goes There slogan. The website boasted that this was going to be their heaviest, hardest hitting season yet, dealing with real teen issues in a real way. And honestly, it didn't disappoint. Secondly, it's the first season of The Next Generation, and maybe of any season, unless we really count 
the movie School's Out, that gave as much screen time to romantic relationships as anything else. In the past, of course, there were relationships portrayed on the show, but they always shared a spot with the issue of the day, or the drama of friendship and family. Starting in season three, romantic relationships are going to take up more and more of the runtime. Your mileage may vary for how that affects the quality of the show, but I remember at the time as a 13 and 14 year old that I was psyched out of my mind. The marketing at the time showed a bunch of random crack characters kissing like Hazel and Toby from the Breakfast Club knockoff episode and I was like all in like what is going to happen but of course the season also paired this by attempting to deal with some heavier topics emboldened I think by the success of their page storyline the season before for example Marco this section contains mentions of homophobia and assault please go to this timestamp or the next chapter if you would like to skip it so I'm gonna start with Marco, because as a queer teen, I can't imagine anything that was more impactful for me than his storyline in this season. I have a lot of mixed feelings and I wanna get them out up front. So in modern queer media, there's an emphasis on letting characters just exist as LGBTQ plus characters. Audiences are, for the most part, tired of long coming out arcs and trauma, either in the form of harassment, bullying, or being disowned by their families. I mean, this is a valid take. Many years ago, I said in my Life is Strange video that turning queer and minority characters into tragedy porn does a disservice to both the straight and the LGBTQ plus audience, and I still stand by that. But I think even now there is still a place for what I will call coming out media. Maybe that's because of when I grew up, but I will always find joy in someone standing up for themselves and being themselves openly, no matter how many times I see it. And if we're measuring the show by when it came out, I think that becomes even more true. Before Degrassi, I personally had never seen a realistic view of what it would look like to come out both to yourselves and others as a modern teenager. And that was groundbreaking for me. And so I'm going to try and judge this storyline both by what it meant to me at the time while trying not to ignore the places that it could have done better, even if those criticisms are coming from a more modern perspective. Marco's storyline pretty much picks up where it left off in season two. Ellie knows Marco is gay. They discussed it in an episode with this Bollywood inspired commercial that they had to shoot, which is delightful. And she doesn't want to be his beard anymore. But Marco clings to that fake relationship, even against Ellie's will, because he's terrified of being outed. Enter Dylan. Dylan was mentioned way back in season one of the show when Paige told Hazel, My oldest brother's gay. And I think his introduction as a character who was already out was very smart. However, Dylan does kind of fall into that trope of the perfect gay. You know the one, like Maxi from Skins? He's cute, funny, smart, he can do nothing wrong. I really like Dylan and I appreciate the role he serves in the show, but I hate to admit that I think he's just a little boring. Look, I know there are folks who love him. He just doesn't do it for me. If I'm being honest, it feels like they forgot to give him a consistent personality. He just kind of does what they need him to do to advance Marco's plot, and that makes him feel shallow, especially now when queer representation is more prevalent than ever and we are getting just like a ton of wonderfully written gay characters. He goes from picking up on Marco's queerness to kind of flirting with him and to encouraging him to be himself to then saying that he doesn't want to move too fast and influence Marco too much. It's just kind of consistent. I'm not saying that characters can't be contradictory. Some of the best characters in this show are. But I don't know Dylan's motivations. We mostly never hear what drives him in his own words, which makes his actions just feel shallow and plot driven. Anyway, at the introduction of Dylan, Marco is emboldened and feeling less isolated than maybe he ever has. He finally admits that he and Ellie quote unquote broke up, giving him a little bit of freedom to stop lying. But when Spinner then sets him up on a date with Hazel, who still has a crush that she's been holding on to since last season, Marco is hesitant, mostly thanks to Ellie here. Instead of choosing to fake it again, he builds on the date entirely and into the alley where he is chased down by Spinner, demanding to know why he would choose his mom's pasta, pasta sauce, sauce over one of the hottest girls in school. This, of course, culminates in one of the greatest moments in television history. Don't get it. Because, man. Because what? Because I'm gay. My wife and I quote this scene probably once a week. My favorite version of the scene is the one that the actors recreated for a Degrassi reunion anniversary special thing where they struggled to get through the scene one time without laughing. Because obviously I'm a moron and I don't because get it. Because Because what? Because I'm gay. <laughs> <laughs> 
it's perfect. Please go watch the whole thing. I'm going to link it below. Anyway, so Marco kind of accidentally comes out to Spinner in a moment of heightened emotions, which is a trope, but it's also kind of how I officially came out to my mom, so it is a realistic one. Marco is terrified that Spinner is going to tell the whole school. It's awful because Marco is now entering that important stage of becoming comfortable with the idea of who he truly is, which makes it that much worse than when he's jumped while walking through the gay village in Toronto for a hockey match. This part of the storyline is interesting to me. Nothing Marco does in this scene, besides taking a shortcut through a part of town known to be a cruising spot, flags him as particularly gay. His targeting is almost completely random. You could argue that the fact that he's young and alone made him more vulnerable than the fact that he was gay. Marco later says that he believes the boys could just tell just by looking at him, but I don't think the writers are actually trying to make that argument. I think, like with the Islamophobia episode in season two, they are trying to make a point about hate-based violence. It's hard to find statistics for victims of hate crimes motivated by sexual orientation who were misidentified, but we do know that this is a thing that happens. Trans youth report being harassed and verbally assaulted with gay slurs for being just gender nonconforming, even before transition, for example. Someone who looks gay can be targeted for being gay. Hate-based violence is rooted in stereotypes and fear, not actual reality. And so like six being targeted for Islamophobia, for example, it is possible to be a victim of a hate crime without being a member of that group. These are known as quote unquote misdirected hate crimes, but that sort of implies that there is a correct target for hate crimes. So I don't know how much I love that phrase. That of course is not what happens here though. Marco is gay. And so random chance or not, this incident convinces him that there is something in him that strangers can see. After this awful trauma, he's terrified that he will never be safe and that even if he did choose to hide, he would not be able to. I can't even imagine how that would feel. Luckily, Marco has incredible friends to support him. We'll talk a little more about Spinner's homophobia and his reaction to Marco in general later, but there's an important scene where Spinner is making the tiniest graffiti ever in the bathroom outing Marco. Jimmy, still totally over Spinner after the last season, accuses Spinner of being a bigot, asking, So what are you gonna write next? Something about me being black? After Marco's gay bashing, Jimmy is there for him, making it clear that he supports his friend no matter what, without even needing Marco to come out to him. The rest of Marco's season arc happens mostly off screen. He gets closer to Dylan over the course of the season, and eventually they get a B plot storyline where they go on a terrible, awkward date. Dylan is concerned that Marco isn't ready, but in the end, it's just general teenage date awkwardness, which is welcome. We've seen a number of wholesome, if sort of cringeworthy, first dates on this show, and adding Dylan and Marco to the list is appreciated. The two part episode Pride would earn Degrassi its first GLAAD Media Award nomination, though not its last. I often think of queer issues as being an area that Degrassi is very comfortable in covering, and I'm excited to talk more about them as they come down the line. Sean, Emma, and Snake. At the same time as Marco's A plot in Pride, Snake is having a whopper of a B plot, something that will actually become common in this season. Some B plots are less comedic relief than they have been in the past, instead focusing on real issues other characters are going through in the background. In this case, it's Archie Simpson being diagnosed with leukemia. But before I can jump into this big plot, I actually have to back up and talk about the season premiere. This is the first season of Degrassi that doesn't have a bookend storyline. Instead, the premiere and finale are basically entirely separate, focusing mostly on different characters and plots. That doesn't make them any less worth talking about, though. Specifically, the premiere, which is a heavy hitter in a lot of ways. First, it's an episode with a lot of ramifications for the story. Spike goes into labor in this two-parter, giving birth to Emma's little half-brother Jack and changing the dynamic of the family forever. And secondly, it's an episode that focuses on Shane, Emma's father and a throwback character from Degrassi Classic. For those who don't know who Shane is, well, first, that means that you haven't watched Degrassi Classic or my videos on it, which both of which I highly recommend. Both the show and my essays are available on YouTube and I will link them in the description. Shameless plug. But as a brief reminder, Shane was Spike's boyfriend and Emma's father. As a teenage boy, he struggled with the responsibilities of being a father, but tried his best despite his worst instincts and the interference of his parents, one of whom was a pastor and wanted him to have nothing to do with Christine and the baby. One night during an ill-advised acid trip, Shane jumped from a bridge, either by accident or on purpose, I maintain that it's unclear, and that perspective is reiterated here in The Next Generation. He jumped off a bridge or fell, who knows. He survived the fall, but sustained massive brain damage that served to remove him from the school, his peer group, 
and the show. He was written out of the show by the time Degrassi High rolled around. So Shane's whereabouts in The Next Generation are just as much a mystery to the audience as to Emma, and so I think the plot about her discovering the truth about her dad was intended to be a little bit of a treat for older fans. There's a lot of that this season. Later, we'll get the iconic two-parter holiday, which is made up of about 80% Joey Caitlin fan service, with all of the scenes that aren't actually directly about Joey and Caitlin still somehow being a callback to School's Out. For whatever reason, the writers saw fit to feed the Degrassi classic fans in season three, and honestly, I thank them for that. Back in the premiere, Emma is convinced her dad is a doctor, as she has vague memories of visiting him in the hospital as a child. When she and Craig find him at a hospital, she enlists Craig on a trip dedicated solely to her daddy issues, which I find a weird choice, but whatever. They discover that Shane is actually a patient there. He's pleased to discover that this lovely teenage girl is actually his daughter, who he's sort of thought of as a toddler this entire time, but then lashes out when it's time for her to leave. Emma gives him her address so he can write to her, but instead, he uses uses it to come visit. And this is where the episode kind of loses me. Without really meaning to or understanding, Shane holds Spike hostage in her own home, where she starts to go into labor. We discover in this two-parter that Shane was kept from Spike by his parents. When Emma yells at her mom that she should have done something, Spike snaps. I was 16! That she was a teenager, and she had no power against two grown adults. I buy this. Both she and Shane were the victims of adults who only thought of their own wants and desires, hurting both Christine and their granddaughter in the process. That's also one of the reasons I'm uncomfortable when Shane's appearance is treated as tense and scary. He is volatile and can be violent. This actually goes back to a scene in Degrassi High, and I learned in my research this can be a symptom of traumatic brain injury. But something about it still strikes me as a little uncomfortable. I think it's because the episode feels like it's both infantilizing and demonizing Shane at once. I don't know, maybe it's an attempt to show a balanced view of his mental state, and so if that's the case, I appreciate what they were going for, although I don't know that they really executed it super well. In the end, we never really see Shane again after this, and maybe that's for the best. Part of that might also have to do with the fact that they had to recast Shane, which is, I believe, the only time they ever recast a character from the original series. It's a super weird choice, but given that I imagine they couldn't get the original actor back, I can kind of see their motivation for doing it. After baby Jack is born, Emma has very little time to herself, a fact that Sean is really struggling with. They're both high schoolers now, and Sean would like a little alone time with his girlfriend. However, with the new baby and after Pride, Snake's new cancer diagnosis, Emma turns into Nurse Emma, leaving very little time for her boyfriend. I really like the conflict here because I don't think either character is at fault. Don't get me wrong, Sean is gonna make some awful choices this season, and even in these episodes, but as far as the ending of their relationship goes, I actually think it's pretty balanced. Sean doesn't feel like his needs are getting met, and Emma just wants one spot in her life where she doesn't have to meet somebody's needs. She's pretty overwhelmed right now. She's coping with that stress by trying to take control and be ultra responsible, which is a coping mechanism that is gonna cause problems for her later down the line. Right now, though, it's making her seem dull and not very fun for Sean, and I mean, you can't fault either of them for that, really. So Sean starts hanging out with a new group of characters, Jay and his crew. And let me just say, thank God, I love Jay. I love Alex. I love that whole group of hooligans. And I never realized how necessary they are to the show until I'm watching the early seasons and they just don't exist. They're a good example of how the show is leaning into an edgier type of realism. We're not in middle school anymore. And so Sean as the bad boy just isn't gonna cut it. Now we have Jay to set a new bar and then Sean immediately rises to meet it. These characters are impressed by Sean's automotive skills. This is subtle but it makes sense as Sean has been working on cars at Trackers since season one. So his usefulness to the crew is actually very believable. Sean, for his part, is just excited to have a place to belong. For the entire run of the show, he's always been a loner and the few times that he's tried to fit in elsewhere, such as with Emma or on his basketball team, has always ended in him feeling insecure and out of place. Jay's crew doesn't make him feel that way. For better or worse, they see him as an equal. Also, I just want to say that Jay and Sean become friends after getting into a fight, which might be one of my favorite tropes in any media. Dudes duking it out and then being chill with each other is like the best. Like all it takes for guys to become best bros is a good old fashioned fist fight. 
It's so good. After Sean and Emma break up, Sean cements his status with the crew and gets back at his ex in one fell swoop by stealing Snake's new Alienware laptop. The scene that follows in which Snake blames the chemo on his misplacing it might contribute to this being, in my opinion, one of the lowest things that Sean ever does. I mean, I know the chemo is making me stupid, but I can't believe I actually lost it. It's heartbreaking. This is also part of a low point for Snake, who's been having a bad time with the chemo, understandably. He's depressed, he can't eat anything, he's hesitant to leave the house because he's immunocompromised, and nothing anyone does really can cheer him up. In a desperate move, Christine decides on the nuclear option. She calls in the zits. And by the zits, I mean both of them. Out of nowhere, with no warning, in the middle of a bowling sequence with Snake and Joey, Derek Wheeler shows up. So this is Wheel's first appearance in Degrassi since school's out. Though the reunion episode did have a deleted scene that may have aired in some places, I'm not sure. In official sources, Wheels hasn't been seen since he was imprisoned for drunk driving. I think the series does a good job of writing this scene so that anyone can understand its importance even without having seen the original series or the TV movie. Perhaps the full impact is lost without the context of their friendship or that Snake hasn't seen Wheels in literally decades, since their big blow up that summer before college. I mean, of course it is. But the weight of wheels and what he says in this scene is still undeniable. As a fan, I will always be glad that they gave Neil Hope one last chance to come on and give his character something of a redemption, even if it was just wheels finally taking some accountability for his actions, something that his character consistently refused to do throughout Degrassi High. It's a touching moment that I think shows respect for where the show has come from and its legacy moving forward. And also, I will always be thankful for this scene of the boys. Never give up. Everybody wants something. They'll take your money and never give up. Snake seems to go on an upturn after this. There's a lovely deleted scene in the holiday episode where he laughs at a terrible photograph of baby Jack taken with Santa at the mall and a non-deleted one where the class all chips in to buy him a wig. Wheels' message to keep fighting seems to have gotten through. And while all this is going on, Sean is having a hard time. He gets dumped by a girl in Jay's gang, Amy, who I just love. They only really bring her out when they need a little drama. So you know that when she shows up, something fun is about to happen. Well, you know, something fun, usually. Sean then starts dating Ellie after the Breakfast Club homage that I swear we're gonna talk about. Not long after Sean and Ellie get together, Tracker gets a super high paying job as an oil miner and asks Sean to come with him, but Sean doesn't wanna lose his whole year. And so after some time, they decide to let him stay. This marks Sean's beginning as an emancipated miner. As I mentioned in my Degrassi High video, this series loves an emancipated miner. I suspect it's for the ease of having a place for characters to go without any adult supervision and not not so much out of a desire to portray the realities of teens who end up in these situations, which is usually not what happens. Almost as if to counteract these accusations though, Degrassi's first episode in Sean's new apartment shows him struggling with the responsibilities of being the place that his friends, specifically Jay's crew, crash and party while trying to keep his grades up so that he can keep his student welfare. The events of the year, and especially the influence of Ellie and the new responsibility of being emancipated have, by the end of the year, made Sean rethink a few things. Though he continues continues to be friends with Jay and that group, he no longer lets them run his life. He kicks them out during a party that gets out of hand and starts going to school on time, focusing instead on keeping his grades up. When Snake gives him some extra help to pass his class, Sean is overcome with guilt of his theft earlier in the year and chooses to come clean. Though Archie is rightfully pissed and more than a little disappointed in Sean, the season ends with Sean doing the only thing he can do to make it up and offering to repair Snake's car for free if Snake buys the parts. His genuine plea to try and make things better get through and Simpson accepts his offer. I really love all the way these stories intertwine this season. Emma gets a little bit more of a storyline when it comes to Manny, but for the most part, I think I would have liked to see more from her than the crazy ex-girlfriend and drama queen characterization that we get from her this season. Honestly though, season three has some peak Emma moments, including one of my favorites here, in which Manny, still annoyed after a fight they had the episode before, says this line to a crying Emma. Okay, what now, Em? It's particularly brutal considering that Emma is crying about Snake's possible cancer diagnosis, but it's also so fair and more proof about why Manny is one of the best characters on the show. 
And that's a great segue into our next section, actually, because this wasn't the only multi-character plot line that spanned the length of the season. In fact, I wouldn't even say that that's the big one. Craig, Manny, and Ashley. There are a few things that I've been excited to talk about since this series started. Things that I look forward to when putting in the work to make these videos. The Kevin Smith cameos. When, uh, that thing happens to JT. A certain, probably toxic emo boy who will not be named, but I will forever remain obsessed with. And, of course, the absolutely amazing dumpster fire that is the love triangle of Craig, Ashley, and Manny. I remember with absolute clarity the winter that Holiday aired on the inn. The promos, the buildup. That holiday season was, for me, synonymous with this two-part Degrassi special. And then, of course, the agonizing wait until summer during the hiatus as, true to form, the inn put some distance between that half of the season and a set of controversial episodes. But before we dig into all of that, let's back up and talk about where everyone stands at the start of season three. So when the season starts, Craig and Ashley have been dating all summer. Ash's hard goth exterior has been softened into a more indie rock girl style to match Craig's. This isn't a dig. I think that this is one of the more viable evolution lines that former goth girls go down. In the 2000s, the hot topic goth to thrifting punk girl pipeline was strong. I mentioned this style evolution in part to set up where Ashley and Craig are in their storylines. They're stable, having come out of some dark times in their lives, more secure and stronger for it. But I also have to bring it up because of the other point in this triangle, who also has her own fashion rebirth. Manuela Santos, who has decided after the fiasco of her terrible date with Craig last year that there's no way I'm getting dumped this year for being too young. This should have gone in the fashion section, but it just deserves its own spotlight because it's an important part of an episode. So we're just gonna be perfectly clear. Slayed, slayed, partially slayed, literally traumatizing. Merry Christmas. And in case any youngins are out there watching wondering if uh, this was a thing that anyone actually did, abso fucking lootly Not me, of course. I was in trip pants and fishnets at the time, as I've exposed in these videos already. But I was around the so-called preps of the time, and it was ubiquitous. I cannot overstate this. Fashion thongs were a necessity for anyone who wanted to be on trend during this time. Unless you wanted to get teased for having a visible panty line, something that 8th graders should not care about, but I digress. You had to wear a thong. But all pants were low waist. Low rise jeans were a menace. This is why all millennials are obsessed with high waisted mom jeans now. Because of the low waist, your thong needed to be cute because it was guaranteed to be seen anyway. I guess everyone just decided to lean into it and do it on purpose. It's the early 2000s. Sleaze and skin was the name of the game, baby. But nobody did it better than Manny. This is still the moment that gets brought up the most often if Degrassi ever comes up in conversation. Well, that and probably Rick and Drake, of course. And really, Manny's transformation sets the tone for the rest of the season. It happens in episode three, technically the first episode after the two-part premiere, and hits viewers over the head. The junior kids aren't in junior high anymore. Although two seconds of seeing JT puberty York on screen probably would have done that too, in fairness. Of course, Manny's outfit is not just for show. It also has a number of ramifications on the actual plot. JT notices Manny for the first time, but she's less than interested. This used to actually bum me out until I saw a deleted scene from season two in which Manny offers to help JT study for his finals and he just completely blows her off. Rude. Her treatment of him after her glow up made sense to me after that. Still, even JT is better than the sleaze balls she ends up attracting. His wholesome, humorous way of flirting is endearing, leading Emma to feel bad for for him. Manny, pleased by all the new attention she's receiving, shades of Steph from Degrassi Junior High, brushes off Emma's criticism, leading to, of course, Emma and Manny fight number four. This is the first fight where I feel like their friendship is actually being put to the test. Unlike the last few, such as the cheerleading story in season one, this is more about a clash of values than common friendship tensions. I honestly think that if Snake had not been diagnosed with cancer immediately after this, the fight might have had more serious consequences on their long-term friendship. We'll see that a lot in 
the future, by the way. Manny and Emma always come back together when one of them is in need, which I think is one of the things that makes the audience root for them as friends, even though their differing values cause conflict for basically the rest of their time in the show. And their problems often are caused by this value difference. For example, in season three, Manny attempts to help Emma win over her crush, Chris. Her advice is to make her move while he's having a fight with his current girlfriend, leading Emma to question whether Manny has done something like this herself. Of course, we the audience know that she has. Earlier in the season, in between leukemia and homophobic hate crimes, Degrassi snuck in a real classic teen issue episode, Craig and Ashley trying to figure out whether or not they should have sex. Ashley already had an episode like this back in season one. Back then, she decided to wait because she figured out she wasn't ready. In Should I Stay or Should I Go, she's more concerned with the who than the what. Craig still hasn't told her that he loves her and she's hesitating to make the next step, unsure of his motivations. Craig who has abruptly switched from photography to guitar this season, responds to her accusation of not loving her by writing a song, claiming that he just needed to find the right way to say it. Earlier, I said I wasn't going to be discussing season three songs in the intermission, and that's because I'm going to be talking about them as they pop up, where they are important to the plot. So honestly, I'm not surprised that Craig scammed not just one, but two girls into falling in love with him over this song. Song them back the way you shine. It's such a dude with a guitar song. This guy's gonna play Wonderwall next, but he does have a nice voice. But this song isn't saying anything that Craig couldn't have said without all of the drama of writing it. When she's around, he's not scared. He dreams about her, etc., etc. He gets bonus points for writing a first line that is directly about sex, a move that shows balls when you consider that Ash thinks that he is only doing all of this to get into her pants. But like I said, not just one, but two girls found this highly effective. Ashley, who has a huge change of heart, and Manny, who happened to walk in right as it started. Paige also saw it and thought it was cute, but uh, did not decide that she wanted to have sex with Craig because of it, proving that there is at least one girl who is immune to his charms. Manny is currently dating that sleaze bag I mentioned from before. He's the opposite of the type of guy we saw her fantasizing about last season, and meanwhile, she looks over and sees Craig sending Ashley a dozen roses and writing her romantic ballads. It's no wonder really that Manny gives the impression that she thinks Ashley doesn't appreciate Craig enough, especially when you consider the guy that she's working with. Now, I'm not here to litigate what Manny does, but I do think that you could arguably blame either side for what happens, and that makes for interesting TV. So let's get to that and dig deeper. Craig's song finally convinces Ashley that it's time to take the next step. Craig, understandably thrilled, lets Spinner in on his secret. Spinner acts like Spinner. And soon, Ash knows that Craig was, at least in her mind, bragging to his friends. Humiliated, as she was hoping to keep this private and between them, she tells him off. Seeing Craig storming out in distress, Manny chases after him. You know that song you sang today? If it was for me, I'd be happy for months. You're the best. And... And what? And... If Ash doesn't see that, then she doesn't deserve you. In the following two scenes, she basically tells him exactly what he wants to hear. His relationship is hard. Ashley often overreacts to things and assumes the worst, and it makes sense that Craig would feel unappreciated. Then, in walks Manny, telling him that it's Ashley who was always in the wrong. I can understand, especially given her later advice to Emma, why some people would assume that this was a calculated move on Manny's part. She knows Craig was in a relationship an hour ago and seems more than willing to ignore that fact. Others argue that Manny was misled by Craig, that he was more in the know about the state of his relationship than she was, and when Ash decides to reconcile at the end of the episode, he is the one that chooses to do so. Manny was naive. Perhaps she thought that their hookup would mean that Craig was planning on leaving Ashley and Craig was not upfront about the fact that it wouldn't. I also just want to add, because I see a lot of hate directed toward Ash for this episode, that I kind of get where she's coming from in this one. <laughs> Please don't throw tomatoes at me. Most of the criticism comes from her apparent demand for Craig to say that he loves her, that they're teens that haven't been dating for that long and she is being unreasonable to expect that from him. And fair enough, fair enough. 
However, I think the context is important here. She doesn't expect him to say that he loves her for no reason. The first time that she says it, it's when he starts making moves to make things more physical between them. It's clear, at least to me, that she wants him to say it back so that their first time can be with someone who truly loves her. But then when he brushes her feelings off, first by making a joke and then by writing you rock as his romantic note with a dozen roses, she panics. She loved him and she made herself vulnerable in telling him and almost had sex with him. And now she feels nervous that she shouldn't have opened herself up like that because he obviously isn't feeling the same way she is. Now, does that excuse her from doing everything else she does and ashing everything up? You don't know how to say it, Craig, because you don't really love me. No, she's still super annoying. But if Craig didn't feel comfortable in saying it, I think he could have communicated that better. As it is, Ash feels like she's not being taken seriously, which is a red flag for her, and she reacts to that. Now, if you've watched a lot of Degrassi, or even just a lot of my videos, this plot might seem a little familiar. A guy hooks up with a girl who has always liked him after he and his girlfriend get into a fight. When the fight cools, he keeps the girl on the side as a fallback, the physical chemistry between the two of them undeniable. That's right. This plot is just Degrassi's schools out, only no one's gonna say fuck this time around. In that movie, in case you didn't know, it was Joey Jeremiah, spurned by Caitlin at her graduation party, who then turned to Tessa Campanelli when he thought things were done with him and Caitlin. I am convinced this parallel was extremely deliberate, which is made even more clear to me in the two-part special Holiday, which is basically exclusively made up of Craig, Manny, Ashley drama with a B-plot of Joey and Caitlin rekindling their relationship from high school. Direct parallels are drawn between Joey and Craig in conversation. Thought I had it all, but I was young and stupid. And I cheated on her with a girl named Tessa Campanelli. Caitlin found out and it was one of the biggest regrets of my life. So I know what you're going through, but trust me, you'll be okay. <sighs> what, like you're okay? Like Caitlin's okay? You guys never got over each other, Joey. And there are even more parallels between some characters, such as Spinner getting to be Wheels, cheering Craig on from the sidelines, and Marco playing the disapproving snake. Holiday itself is a really fun two-parter, intended to be a Degrassi holiday special. It has a lot of fun winter moments, as sort of reverse parallels to the summer fun in School's Out. Instead of a beach, we get a skating rink. Instead of a lake party, it's a winter pageant. Unlike School's Out, Craig's downfall feels a little bit more believable. Joey seemed pleased to be getting some from Tessa, but ultimately it was always gonna be Caitlyn for him. Craig seems more confused. He wants to choose one, but he's not sure which. He has incredible chemistry and fun with Manny, but he finds emotional and creative fulfillment in his relationship with Ash. Eventually, he ostensibly chooses Manny, but when the tiniest hitch gets in the way of dumping Ashley, he puts it off. It may be that he would have broken up with her after the talent show, or if she hadn't given him a super nice guitar for Christmas, but ultimately, we will never know. Both Manny and Ashley discover he's been lying to them, and he loses them both, despite all of Joey's warnings. In the B-plot, though, Joey ends up winning Caitlin Ryan back after cheating on his current girlfriend with her, undermining the message somewhat, I think. I mean, look, I love this storyline from the nostalgia alone, but it is a little weird in context. But I digress. At the end of Holiday, Craig is just like Joey at the end of School's Out, alone and girlfriendless. And the only thing that would really nail the comparison is if Craig had gotten Manny pregnant, just like Tessa. Oh no. So now we've reached that hiatus on the end that I told you about. Regardless of the motivation for splitting up this season, which we will talk about later, putting in a hiatus is a smart move. Putting Degrassi out in two blocks makes it easier to marathon the show, pulling in more viewers who would catch up during those long stretches without new episodes. I've always suspected that this hiatus here is like the one in season two. They created it to buy time to figure out how to deal with a set of controversial episodes that might not play well in George W. Bush's United States. This gave them quite a few months to figure out a strategy as the second block of episodes wouldn't be airing until summer. And they needed a strategy. Accidents Will Happen actually features an important-ish B-plot that explains why Jimmy and Toby end up at school on the Saturday detention episode. The end got around this by stripping the B-plots out of those two episodes, one in which Liberty gets a crush on Sean and one in which Toby tries to impress Jimmy by changing his grades on the computer system and airing them as special mini-sodes during the Countdown to Degrassi premiere for the summer half of the season. The summer half of the season also gave them a 
perfect cover for choosing not to air the two-parter. In Entertainment Weekly in 2004, a spokesperson for The Inn claimed that the episode was being pulled not because of its abortion content, but because the summer block was meant to be the light-hearted block, and accidents will happen would have ruined the beachy summer vibes, man. Of course, The Inn could change the order of episodes. I mean, it had before, after all, with Paige's storyline. Accidents would happen could have been a fine finale before the show went on hiatus. But the tone argument made for a convenient excuse for a network that traditionally had been more comfortable editing some of the content down for an American audience. To much debate on the Degrassi.tv forums and other internet message boards, The Inn had already cut down scenes of Craig's abuse, his moment in front of a train, Ellie cutting herself, and others. There was a general understanding in the American fandom at the time that the Inns version didn't go there the same way that the Canadian broadcast did. The season 3 DVD set even leaned into this, marketing it as the director's cut, calling Accidents Will Happen the episode you can't see on TV in the US. The network would eventually air the episode on the Inn. Once, two years later during a favorites marathon in which actors got to choose their favorite episodes featuring their characters, Cassie Steele picked Accidents Will Happen happen as a standout for her character Manny, obviously. The episode then aired again during the 2008 Every Degrassi Episode Ever Marathon. After that, the episode would re-air during subsequent rebroadcasts of the show as if it had never been taken out. So okay, the band episode. What was all the fuss about? Honestly, not much. In this two-parter, Manny discovers that she's pregnant and reconnects with Craig, unsure of what to do next. The first part of this two-parter is pretty great. <laughs> Manny's denial of what is happening, followed then by her acceptance and telling Spike, who also had a kid at 14, really works for me. Craig is excited about the prospect of a relationship with Manny and starting a family. When Ashley finds out, she, oh my god, she bitterly reveals the pregnancy to the whole school. Hey, everybody, these two idiots are pregnant. That's right, because it's way too difficult to use a condom. I wrote this like matter of fact, but I just can't, I can't. Ashley will casually do some of the worst stuff in this entire show and then never have to be held accountable for that. What is that about? God, that's awful. After a disastrous babysitting job with little Jack, however, Manny realizes she's far from ready to take care of a baby. Emma tries to encourage her friend to give up the baby for adoption. Pro-life Emma strikes again. But when Craig tries to pressure Manny into keeping it, Emma then steps in and defends her. In a touching scene, Manny then reveals her pregnancy to her strict mom, who takes her to a clinic to terminate the pregnancy. Obviously, for a lot of reasons, Accidents Will Happen is just an iconic two-parter. In a lot of ways, it's an updated version of the storyline from Degrassi High. However, it falls into a number of teen drama tropes that I find take away from the grounded reality that the original series brought to the topic. The arguments between Emma, Manny, and Craig are all very powerful, though. Craig does come off a little whiny when he insists that it's his baby, too. It's my baby! But at least the father is addressed here in a way that he wasn't in Degrassi High. The consequences of these episodes will have ripple effects for the rest of the show. With Manny's pregnancy revealed to the rest of the school, she gains a reputation that follows her around for seasons. JT, however, isn't bothered by that, and by the end of the season, Manny decides to give him a real chance. Craig remains heartbroken over her abortion, but later in the season he does check in on Manny, making sure she's okay, and establishing a low-key friendship with her. Ash and Craig are not so easily handled. In the episode Rock and Roll High School, Ash has formed a band with Ellie, Hazel, and Paige and written a brutal revenge song about Craig. I specifically remember watching this episode in Nebraska that summer when I was visiting my dad, and his opinion was that the song was an absolute banger. He said that he felt sorry for Craig for having the misfortune of pissing off such a talented girl. And I don't know, I will always remember that. I really do love Mr. Nice Guy, the song. It's such a good little burn for poor Craig, who just in this episode was trying to make up with everyone without taking any real accountability for his actions. I'm sorry, I made fun of your lyrics earlier. You're a really good writer and musician, and that wasn't fair. This is about my lyrics? Yeah. What did you think? 
I also particularly like the line, you're the dust in my eye, you're the rock in my shoe, painting him as a minor annoyance more than anything else. Of course, it's Craig's song that really gets the attention here. Craig screams into the microphone about how much he sucks. What I know is that I suck, and what I know is that I'm sorry. And everybody just eats it up, including 14-year-old me and Ashley Kerwin, who, for whatever reason, always falls for whatever Craig says as long as he's singing it. In the end, Ash accepts his apology without really forgiving him, and they also remain tentative friends for now. It may seem like I'm being extra harsh on Craig here, maybe I am, but I want to state on record that I really love him as a character, even this season. I totally believe both that his mistakes are things that a teenage boy would make, and also that he feels bad about them. And during the Battle of the Bands, when he growls, what I know is that I suck, and what I know is that I'm sorry, into the mic, it's basically a perfect encapsulation of his character. I messed up. Again? And again, and again. I'm sh I'm sh I mean, I actually like all of the characters here. That's not to say I agree with all of their choices. Manny was either naive or calculating, neither of which look good for her. Ash remained something of a harpy, and Craig at best couldn't give either girl the respect they deserve to make a choice, and at worst, manipulated and lied to both of them for his own selfish desires. But God, does that make good TV? Like early on in the marketing for season one of The Next Generation, they kept saying, we're not like Dawson's Creek. We're so different from Dawson's Creek. But I will say that someone watched Dawson's Creek and learned the right lesson from it. Make the kids messy. They did it. It was great. Hopefully I won't have to go into too many more storylines into this level of detail too often. However, you're gonna wanna remember this love triangle because it's not the last time we're gonna see it. Moving on. Terry and Rick. This section contains discussion of intimate partner violence. I've talked before about Terry's struggles with self-esteem, and so, like Kathleen before her, Terry was a prime target for someone like Rick. Yeah, that's right, we're talking about Rick. Rick started out as a secret admirer, leaving flowers on Terry's locker with romantic notes and poetry. Originally concerned that it may be Toby due to his odd behavior. Toby, are you following me? I don't know. Terry is excited when it actually turns out to be her crush, the nerdy, soft-spoken Rick. Little does this guy know he's going to become one of the most infamous and hated characters in all of Degrassi. In a later episode, Rick's controlling side starts to come out. I like this when compared to the Degrassi High story that it is very deliberately echoing. In that, Kathleen's abuse seems to come mostly out of nowhere, starting, at least on screen, already at an 11. Here in The Next Generation, we see more of an escalation, as well as a few more red flags initially, such as as Rick's insecurity about himself and about Terry and the guys who surround her. The slow burn of it makes Terry's response to his physical assaults easier to digest, I think. We see his softer side, and like in Craig's storyline last season, we see the familiar pattern of abuse and then a honeymoon phase where he gives her gifts and fawns over her. Terry also expresses a fear that she'll never find another guy like Rick, and so her hesitance to tell her friends is built on a foundation of both insecurity and doubt that anything bad is even really happening, a common form of gaslighting found in many types of abuse. Nobody loves you, and he loves me, and you want to take that away? Terry? I mean, we have to remember that teenagers who have never really had serious relationships before are so vulnerable for this type of abuse. Eventually, after prodding from her friends and an especially explosive outburst from Rick, Terry tells him off and cuts him out of her life cold. As I discussed in my Degrassi High video, this is both an important step, but also a difficult one. Abusers often do not wish to let go of their victims, and victims can find it hard to get away from them, and Rick doesn't let Terry go quite so easily. Months later, long after you would be forgiven for assuming that was a one-off episode, Rick and Terry come together once again. After they're forced together during class, Rick tells her he wants to change. Nervous and insecure about being the fifth wheel to her couple friends on an upcoming road trip, Terry decides to give Rick another chance. It's quickly demonstrated that he hasn't changed at all, though, his behavior just as controlling and erratic as before. When Paige insults him at a rest stop during the trip and Terry doesn't defend him the way that he would like, the two get into a fight. Lashing out in anger, Rick proceeds to physically assault Terry, where he pushes her to the ground and she hits her head on a cinder block. And Rick, terrified, bails, leaving her friends to take her to the hospital. 
The rest of this episode is dedicated to the classic Degrassi-style roundtable discussion and Terry's dad chastising her friends when he finds out that they knew about Rick's violence. A fair criticism, I believe, except for Degrassi's ultimatum to never let adults solve the kids' problems. While I do think that asking your kids' peers to come to you if they're in trouble is reasonable in real life, it's simply not Degrassi's M.O. Unfortunately for Terry, Degrassi will continue its streak of characters who are brought into the hospital simply disappearing from the show, and while Terry does recover off screen and moves to a private school, we never see her again after this. Terry and Rick's storyline is pretty good. It's pretty grounded and well written, although maybe a little awkwardly acted in some places. Ray, you mustn't give up hope! Honestly, it probably wouldn't even be worth mentioning if it didn't have some really important ramifications further down the line. I don't dislike this storyline when it's by itself, but it is only in the later seasons that it will become elevated to the status that we know it as now. Ellie and Take On Me. This part of the video will discuss self-harm. Please skip to this timestamp or the next section if you feel uncomfortable at any time. Please visit the links in the description to find help. So this is the season where Ellie becomes more of her own character, rather than a sidekick to Ashley and Marco's storylines. I have a lot of ambivalence towards Ellie moving forward into later seasons, but I really have no problems with her in these two. Ellie is introduced as a smart, quiet, alternative girl. In a way, she hints at the existence of cliques at Degrassi, which is something we didn't see a lot of in Season 1. Perhaps that is why she is given more screen time here in Season 3, which seems to be interested in exploring the dividing lines between students of different social statuses. Ellie's big episode this season is Whisper to a Scream. In it, we learn that her dad is being deployed to Iraq, leaving Ellie alone with her mom, who struggles with alcoholism. As her mom's drinking becomes worse, Ellie begins to buckle under the pressure of having having to take care of herself and her mom, keep up her grades, and continue working at a prestigious internship with Caitlin Ryan. Editing cat here. So I was kind of surprised to realize that I hadn't put this in the script anywhere, but I just want to mention that Ellie is kind of Caitlin Ryan's closest analog character in this show. I know that might sound kind of weird because I just spent a lot of time comparing Caitlin to Ashley, but that was mostly for that specific storyline. For basically the rest of Degrassi, the writers are going to treat Caitlin as kind of a template for Ellie moving forward. For better or worse, because any criticisms that I have of Ellie are basically the same criticisms that I had of Caitlyn in the earlier seasons. As the pressure rises, she learns how to release some of it by cutting her arm. I don't know if I should call the fear around teen cutting in 2004 a moral panic, but it was a concern. Like the rising fear of teen suicides in the 80s, there was a lot of discussion about groups of kids getting together and spreading it, like it was a contagion. As usual, Degrassi reflects the fears of adults by telling the true story of children, and they chose to explore the why over the how, giving us a look into Ellie's psyche and demonstrating her deep pain and lack of control in her life. From the moment the episode aired, it was well received by audiences, especially those with an experience with the topic. Those who might have felt seen for the first time in a media environment that was all too quick to stigmatize what they were going through, to turn it into some kind of teen fad or something that they were doing just for attention. Degrassi, on the other hand, seemed to be taking it seriously. However, the episode is not without criticism. Some people believe the depiction of cutting, however brief, to be too graphic for the intended audience, possibly triggering them. And this actually may well be true. A group of girls cutting themselves at a school in Canada could be traced back to the episode's air date, possibly promoting the behavior. Ellie's actress, Stacey Farber, was asked about this in an interview with Pop Girls, where she revealed that the producers sat her down to talk about it. As far as I can tell, they took the filming of this topic very seriously. Stacey was given a documentary about cutting for research, and the creators themselves took great care to make sure that she knew that she wasn't to blame for anyone hurting themselves as a result of this episode. The episode was, I believe, cut down for an American audience when it aired on the end, although the full version of the episode was released on the quote-unquote director's cut DVD. At the end of the episode, Paige, who has been Ellie's rival for the majority of it, confronts her when she sees the aftermath of Ellie hurting herself in the bathroom. A later scene where Paige touches Ellie's exposed arm ends up getting me every time. Ellie. At Paige's insistence, Ellie begins seeing Miss Sauvé, the woman that Paige talked to after her rape, and eventually begins treatment for self-harm. 
We actually see this treatment in a later episode in which Ellie snaps a rubber band on her wrist, a common but controversial substitute for cutting that was more common back then, I think, than it is now. The episode in question is, of course, Take On Me, the Breakfast Club inspired episode that I've been putting off talking about for most of the video. I've made such a big deal about this one because it's one of my favorites in the series and a fan favorite in general. It's unashamed in any way that it's ripping off a beloved 80s flick for its own storyline. In Take On Me, we join a group of characters who have been racking up Saturday detentions all season. Sean for his antics with Jay, Jimmy and Toby for trying to hack into the computer system, Hazel for apparently surfing porn on the school computer, and Ellie for skipping class. Like the movie on which it's based, the episode deals with cliques and social status, as well as the misunderstandings that happen between members of different groups. In the end, the characters mostly walk out with a stronger understanding of each other than they had coming in, with two new romantic relationships having been sparked. After about a year of flirtation, Jimmy and Hazel finally get together, and Sean and Ellie, despite the reveal that in the end, Ellie was just there to record them and to try and write a good story for her co-op with Caitlin Ryan. This is one of those rare episodes of TV that I love. Fun, goofy, maybe a little gimmicky, the kind that you rewatch just for fun, but it also happens to push the plot or characters forward in some way. I'm thinking like Once More with Feeling from Buffy or that one lost episode where they fix up the minibus or Hush from Buffy. Listen, <laughs> Buffy happens to do this particular thing very well. A lot of threads that you would otherwise thought had been dropped before get picked up and settled in this episode. For example, Toby missing hanging out with Jimmy, which was a relationship that we saw a number of times early on in season one, but of course after Jimmy and Ash broke up in season two, kind of vanished. Revealing that Toby misses that relationship and wants that respect from Jimmy sort of gives a depth to the characters and the story that we hadn't seen. Characters in the background are going through things too. The same thing happens with Jimmy and Sean. In this episode, they sort of finally manage to bury the hatchet between them and, and any rivalry between them is pretty much gone after this. On top of the growth of the relationships of the characters, there's also a lot of fun to be had in this episode. The kids sneaking onto the roof, uh, Radich doing aerobics in the gym, Archie telling him, This is the first Saturday in months so I haven't felt like dying, Dan. And life, it's way too short. Also, there is a deleted scene of Miss Hatsalakos and Radich making out in the car that may have been cut, but remains canon in my heart. Everything about this episode is great. It gets an 11 out of 10. I'll rewatch it every time. Specifically for Ellie, this is the beginning of her relationship with Sean, one that will be very important to both of them. For both, this is their first real relationship as they push through insecurities and problems that they never had to worry about before. They both choose to move forward and to try and make each other better people. Other than that, Ellie is just kind of a fun, constant part of the cast. Instead of just being around in the background in scenes with Ash, she shows up more often, later on Sean's arm, but also around Marco and other characters, fitting in like she's always been there. Spinner. Time for more of the saga of Spinner, the character we will be following for quite a while. In this season specifically, we're going to talk about his homophobia. After the events of Pride, which I detailed earlier, Spinner settles into a kind of reluctant friendship with Marco. He doesn't really want to hang out with him, but the rest of the friend group isn't dropping the guy just because he's gay, so Spin has to put up with it. That doesn't mean he does so silently, though. He frequently makes little jabs about Marco's sexuality, often when he's feeling insecure, such as when Spinner reveals to Craig that he's not getting any either. Somebody here hasn't made it past third base himself. Like you know anything about getting the home plate, you're too busy checking out the bat boy. As the show goes on, the barbs come less and less frequently, all up until an episode where the boys hang out at Jimmy's house to study for a test. In it, Spinner's gay panic reaches an absolute peak, and Marco finally lets loose on him. After making comments all night, Spinner starts choking and Marco attempts to perform the Heimlich. Spinner decides he would literally rather die than let a gay man touch him and runs around from Marco. This ends with Marco telling him off, informing Spinner that he's really not his type, teaching Spinner that not all gay guys are into every dude they see, and that he can definitely do better than Spinner. And to tell you the truth, you're not even that cute. 
This is kind of the turning point in their relationship. Over time, Spinner will come to accept that. It may seem hard to believe, watching his casual homophobia in this season, that Spinner will later defend queer people from a homophobic member of a Christian youth group, but I think that Degrassi earned this one. This kind of slow acceptance is something that a lot of queer people have witnessed in their own lives. People just kind of learn to live with it. And once that happens, then they begin to question why they ever thought there was anything wrong with homosexuality or trans people or whatever in the first place. I'm not saying that that's the case all of the time, but for teen boys whose fear is mostly based on ignorance and inexperience, then yeah, I buy this. I also like that Marco and Spinner's stories aren't actually very tightly connected. While Spinner's acceptance of gay people is obviously related to Marco, it's not as though Marco spends all of his time worrying about it or trying to teach Spinner. It's not Marco's story because it's not Marco's problem. Spinner's homophobia is his problem, and so his change of heart comes in his own storyline. Lightning round things of note that I didn't find a place for in the script. In season three, Liberty kind of gets over her crush on JT and starts dating cool guy I really like this for her. In Rock and Roll High School, when Craig can't figure out how to write good lyrics, Spinner and Jimmy decide to write a misogynistic rap. And chicks like you ain't worth too much, so shut up, girl, and make my lunch. Yeah! The actor who plays Yik Yu makes a tiny, tiny cameo appearance in the poster of an action movie in the episode Don't Dream It's Over. Billy Ray Cyrus plays their super weird country limo driver, which is just like such a fun little cameo. At the end of season three, there is another fire at a Degrassi dance, giving me a chance to do this. Oh my god! I'm gonna miss the school! <laughs> Conclusion. So I realized I'd written this whole part of the script and I didn't actually give a lot of my thoughts wrapping up seasons two and three. I don't have an overall theme for what was going on in season three. I get the feeling that what the Degrassi writers were doing was attempting to showcase the realities of teen life in a sort of grounded way, while still recognizing the way that some of these things that happen to teenagers can feel like the end of the world. Season three is sort of the beginning of them playing with the melodrama that I think later seasons of Degrassi would more become known for. It's one of the reasons that I refer to season three as peak early season in Degrassi. The ambition is super high, but it's probably one of the last seasons that will attempt to feel realistic as opposed to giving in to teen drama tropes. There are shades of this already, like Craig bringing the book of baby names to school or an emphasis on the characters being in bands and creating music. For the most part, character choices are still believable because they're still based on motivations that we've seen from those characters. Their pasts are taken into account when choosing arcs. Their choices also have an effect on the stories of those around them, which is one of the reasons I think that these seasons are praised. But we are also starting to see the beginnings of characters making choices, at least in part, because that's what will create the the most drama. I think this is what people mean when they criticize later seasons for not being realistic or for characters being inconsistent. By the end of season three, Degrassi had become something of a cultural force. In 2004, The Inn, impressed by the viewership that the show pulled in, created their own South of Nowhere, something that they marketed as a kind of U.S. Degrassi. This was a reach, in my opinion, even though I do stand that dumpster fire of a show, but I don't really have a lot of time to talk about that right now. Maybe another time? Let me know if you want a South of Nowhere video. Regardless, this was, I think, proof that Degrassi was growing into something bigger than anyone ever expected. The removal of Accidents Will Happen from the summer lineup made entertainment news, as well as an article in the New York Times. The word was out. Degrassi was covering harder and harder topics and becoming well known for its ability to tackle them well. The show also continued to have a reputation for never talking down to kids, remaining accessible to them while still being enjoyed by older audiences. Season three also marked the return of a number of classic characters like Joey, Caitlin, and the brief Wheels and Shane cameos, bringing the nostalgia heat harder than they ever had before and probably ever would again. But could they keep it up? Would that pressure to continue to create more intense, realistic storylines become too much? That's next time. Until then, 
I've been Kat. If you liked this look at seasons two and three, please give it a like or comment to feed the algorithm. I live or die by that thing. And make sure to subscribe if you don't want to miss the next one. I have a Patreon where viewers get early ad-free access to all of my videos, as well as some bonus stuff that I post from time to time that I'm going to try and post more of in 2022. Here are all my lovely patrons for this video, which includes three whole months of folks while I worked on this video. Um, a special thanks to Cassandra Barker, Isabella Petroni, Mary Daniel, Smith and Z and Tobo. And thank you to everyone else who supports this, either by donating or by sharing this with your friends. It means a lot to me. Thank you so much for watching all the way to the end. This one was a beast. Um, I hope you have a great day. Oh, and of course they announced the reboot of Degrassi while I was editing this video. <laughs> this retrospective is never gonna end.